I want to start talking about big data and then I go back to talk about the Internet of Things. Uh, I think the people, the companies that have been talking about big data, uh, data were Infosys and your IBM. They've been very particular about big data. Why have we had big data? Why do you want to talk about big data? What's, what's about it? Uh, it's the introduction of the internet, the introduction of the web, the introduction of social, uh, social networks. I think we, we used to have uh, 600 kilobytes being a dust XT computer and giving information to the whole uh, company, the whole finance with 780 kilobytes. But now things have really changed. Information is piling, it's coming in the form of picture, it's coming in the form of uh, you know, a lot of media reports is coming in in the form of uh, people networking and, and doing WhatsApps and data is just piling and piling uh, and that has seen the advent of more and more data and basically when we say big data, that is what we mean uh, because it's now big data, the data is complex, the data requires speed and the data requires volume, it needs to move fast if, if, you, if your data is not moving fast, if your data is not complex, if your data is not volume, it doesn't form part of this. And what has happened because of the Internet of Things is that data now, because of its size and complexity, will need to be stored somewhere. I think in the progression of life, you have seen people getting, you know, on, online real time, online real time now, online analytical processing. Now it's now online, online and spot results are required. But the data is sitting in a container. So for you to be able to access or get whatever you want, your data must sit somewhere. And that's what we call big data. We are saying our data is coming from various entities, but it must not stay in one, uh, it must not stay in different pockets. It must stay in one container. And from that one container is where we pick up the information that we want. Um, of obviously, for example, the body is one example of where we get big data because of the central nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord, and, and, and the nerves, and the uh, information is flowing from one end to end. It's a very connected machine, but all the data at some point is interpreted with action takes place from the head. So there's no one single definition, but big data is data whose skill or diversity and complexity require architecture, techniques and algorithms, analytics to manage it and extract it, uh, value hidden in it to come up with a decision. All right? And that is uh, just a pictorial presentation of what we get in big data, in the big data platform. You, you've got you to unlock your big data, um, you've got your the cost, the, this hard hook is a tool that is used by IBM just to be able to analyze and drill down and get information. All right? The, the real issues around big data, which people might need now to know, is its characteristics, is that data is now uh, coming in big size. I think we no longer talk terabytes. We're talking petabytes, exabytes, and zettabytes. I'm not going to do a lot of technical detail here because of the combination that we have in here. We don't have all that IT, IT people in here. But estimates have shown that this is how data is going to draw uh, as we go into the years. We're now looking at, obviously, something like 50 trillion. What is making this data available? What is this data? What makes it? What are the units of that data? data it's complex, it's coming from text, it's coming from numerical writing, it's coming from images, it's coming from audio, it's coming from your social metadata. It's, it's all, now you don't need to store it in different pockets. You need to store it in one place. And from that one place is where you take your information out. All right? Are we still together? Yes. Is it making any sense? Yes. All right? And uh, we, we said data must now move with speed. And this is why we now need, we have got the telecommunication guys that are in here, that for data to move from point A to point B, there must be speed. 
And this is the one thing that has now come become very important is the Wi-Fi environment, your wireless fidelity. That wherever you are, you must be connected to the person next to you or to the person next to you or to your mother who is in the US. Some people are even busy now doing WhatsApp while we are doing this. And that information is moving. In here we've got a Wi-Fi mesh or connectivity that is connecting us. So, but that data to move from one point to point B, it must have one characteristic. There must be speed or velocity. If there's no speed, you can't download the picture that you want. So that has become very, very important as a characteristic of big data, speed. That's why uh, telecoms are going to be moving and they are moving towards LTE, long-term evolution, uh, to be able to provide the speed that is required and accurate to move with that data. But as the data moves from point A to point B, there are various interceptions that take place within the, the, the road of the data. As the packet moves from him to me, in between the, there can be some guys who can do funny things, or who can interfere, or who can interject, or who can pocket in and pin onto that data, or pin onto it, and take it and use it. Use it competitively, use it for stealing, use it for abuse, use it for, you know, for, for, for weakness. And, and while people are all here, this whole big data is not safe. So, so the, the essence of, of, of the big data and the insurance is to say, this is our data. How safe is it? How is it moving in the channels? If it is not safe and we lose it, what are we going to do? I think that's where it, it will start. It, it makes a lot of, of meaningful, meaningful sense. Uh, in in, in, uh, in Monica, one of the things that we do is we do forensic audit. We trace, we trace if, 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 if you suspect your, your, your wife is cheating you, uh, you steal her phone when she's sleeping, or your husband is cheating you, you steal his phone while she's sleeping, and you give it to us because it's got password. You say, open it, I want to see her messages. How secure is your phone? I got a phone here sitting next to the, the one that is flipped down there, which now comes up with applications where I need your phone number only. And if you've got that application in there, I can manage to pay on what you have. So at some level, I can do that on a certain telecommunication. The network guys, on a certain network. So I think we can do that on certain networks. And certain networks are still locked. But, but that is where we are going with this presentation. I don't, I don't want to play in with that. But I just want people to have a picture that because of the introduction of the internet, because of the introduction of the web, because of the introduction of the social networks, your, your, your WhatsApp, data is now amassing and amassing and amassing. It has become so big and it has been put uh, wherever it is stored, whether in the cloud or on your server, it's huge. To get onto that data, we use big data analytics. All right. A few things about the Internet of Things uh, before we go on to the... I think what has now happened, which, which you all agree with me, is that everything is, is now networked and linked. We really don't need this money anymore. As we are now, we can pay using Echo Cash, we can pay using NetCash, we can pay using... What is the FBC Cash? Mobile Mula. You can pay using mobile money. So really don't have to worry about this. I think what you now going to worry more about is, uh, is the bank, is the bank set, is the bank insured? Are the bank needs insured? If the bank needs are not insured, then you, get, you lose your money. That's it. Eh? And, and, and you've seen this progression from your, your, your card, <coughs> your usual max track card, track one, track two, track three, well, I don't know the family. Track one, track two, track three, track one is PIN primary, personal identification number, track two is your PAN, your primary account number, track three, they own writing, so they went to EMVI, and now you have got the smart cards. But there are guys who develop the software for those smart cards to read them and they interpret them and be able to decrypt the PIN algorithm. Algorithm is a solution procedure. The PIN process for for opening that smart card and getting the money in or out. There are people who write that software. And there are people who write the software to read that security and break into it. And those are the people that you can never stop. iPhone now, what they do is if you break onto that iPhone 6, if they know you've broken onto that software and put another network, they'll contact you and they give you a job. How did you do it? Wait for this. You want to log on the next page and so on and so on and so on. 
But the issue, so, so really you can't say you are, you are what I'm trying to, to get to is, you can't say you are very secure now. Because your data, the information that you have, somebody can get into it. If you really want me to prove it, I can. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if, if you, re and I'm not saying security is not a Security can be secure, as you continuously have to have it secure. Because I think the insurers will also make sure that you've got certain security dimensions within your company before they insure. If you don't have those certain security dimensions, you don't qualify for that particular type of insurance. Just like a car, we can't insure a car 20 years old for a value of a 2015 bill. All right, the world is flat for an abundance of evidence of the trend so far in the 21st century. We all know that, and this guy, Friedman, said it a long time. What he was talking about, he was talking about the global village, that you will not live alone whether you like it or not. I mean, my mother is late now. She was, she joined the internet. And she says, don't give me that good phone. Give me a phone where I can send a message to the family. She will type, she will say to us, Ningina Ninga was going to take a calf on water. And we will listen to the body. Eh? So that's the world, how flat it is. We can, we can now access information. And, and this is demystified, obviously, disintermediation. And uh, things have been connected. Everybody knows that they are connected. We cannot keep hammering on that. But what has, been, what has happened is disintermediation, where the intermediaries for certain products, certain services, certain trainings have been eliminated. And they have been eliminated because there are tools that can move data from point A to point B without going through somewhere. For example, we now have your, your data centers. Your data center, your data centers in Zimbabwe. So when you set up, you are a doctor, you are setting up your office, you don't want to worry about security, safety, where to store the information and all that. You say, guys, do you have a data center? Yes, we do. Can I read it? Yes. What are the requirements? These are. So all the records and the information for the doctor stays in the data center. Eh? Eh? That's what smart people do. You can't be seen to be building an empire of an ICT setup this day and age. You're going to have to either go cloud, go data center. But the data center, one of the things that they should have, they should be insured for that data. The security should be up to a certain level that it's insured. All right? So that has taken away a lot of my small store to take a My info, my hard drive, my hard drive in town. You only now have to deal with the data center. But the data center are the people who still promote this. But there's a lot of disintermediation that takes place worldwide. Re-intermediation has now come up where value addition is expected and people, you're going back to stick to your meeting, remember? And there is cyber mediation, the new kind of intermediation. All right, so I picked up this yesterday from the internet. It says, while the future is digital, the number of people connected to the internet is exploding, going to 1.8 billion in 2010, growing to one, uh, going from 1.8 billion in 2010 to 2.8 billion today. It is many as 5 billion by 2020. The IT guys would agree with me that we have more than 6 billion IP addresses now. We do. And, and what that is doing is those billions of IP addresses, they are basically saying get connected. Get connected. And that's why I always say technology always equals in our world. Technology does not stop. Ecology created technology. But technology is not stopping. Ecology is now affected by technology. But ecology is not, technology is not prepared to apologize to technology because ecology is saying to technology, you created us. Yeah? <laughs> you know that? You know that GM 10, God made men. Men made man. Man made men rich. All right? All right, are we together? So, so, so you can get into a house where Baba and Mama and Nevala, they are sitting, they are all serious. On WhatsApp. You can't even say someone. Room be told a bread in my kitchen. She'll be cross with you. Say, oh, Mama. Why? I'm busy with my friends. Technology has created a spectrum of operation that it is not prepared to apologize to the ecosystem, the interdependence of the family of living organisms. But technology continues. It doesn't stop. So even though that was a 
You're going to have to join. <laughs> All right, and people can use it. The challenge that obviously these guys, the IP, the IP guys, Cat 5, I thought Cat 5 was the last, now there's Cat 6, now we're going to have to go to 5. And now we're going to have to connect to Tura and everything. So there is really no way you will be left out, my brother. The internet of things, everything, getting connected. Logistics, it has to be combined. Transportation, medical, healthcare, industrial energy. What happens in the States, for example, if you have got a fridge, which you panel to a certain, to a, uh, let me give you this example, interconnected. You've got, a, you've got a fridge that is connected on the wall, where you configure that we eat 500 grams a month of measure. If it goes below 500, what? So if it goes to 499, it will trigger an instruction to five suppliers of blue band measuring. Five suppliers will send in a quote. The system will evaluate on its own to say, okay, this is this we bought from this before. Their price is competitive. They are secure. They are on our they are on our listed supply. You list your supply electronica. You say I will buy from TM, I will buy from SPA, I will buy from these guys. So your system is going to approve the suppliers. So what it does is trigger the instruction, measure it below reorder level. Okay, they send in quotes, the system evaluates over this level. We bought from this guy last month. This can deliver, this is how we stop. Okay. It selects the one that is for. So it sends an order to the camera that is with blue band. So those guys, they will confirm the order. Once the order has been confirmed, it comes to your phone for an OTP, a one time piece. It says, major order, this amount, this much, this price, for this address. Confirm. You confirm, yes. When you confirm, it straight away goes to the bank, to your bank account, <laughs> deducting this money for this account, for this much of this measuring, for this address. Confirm. You confirm yes. Send back an OTP, an OTP request. Are you sure? Say, yes, I'm sure. So it goes, debits your account, credits the supply account. Well, on that price, there is transporter's money there. There's transporter's money there. So the transporter's money is there, and, and, and the, the shop that is doing the warehousing. So immediately, their accounts are credited. They get a message with the address. You got time to say, from spa to my house, it must take them 15 minutes to deliver from the time of confirmation. So within the 15 minutes, you will get that message to say, and they'll, they'll drive to your gate. They've got the pin code that they use, they're barcode. I'm sure they've that in the United States. So they go in there, they show the barcode, the barcode will send a message to you to say, so and so on the gate with this banner trying to deliver me. Confirm yes, you say yes. So it opens, mm -hmm. brings in the tray for me, you put in the tray for me, it checks first, is it the correct weight? Checks on the weight, the correct weight. Okay, is there? So you've got three seconds to do that. Checks in, slides it back in, closes the door, closes the panel. And that, that code thing is the one that you use for opening the gate when you get there with your delivery the truck. Close this. You've got three seconds to put the mesh, get it closed and confirm, and drive out. Because the gate will lock you in. So you drive out. Efficient. Speed. Velocity. Right? Interconnectivity. The questions that come around that in America, as you will see, on breaches and amounts and claims and all that, I'm sure you've heard the, the Harvard you know, mess, mess up that they did on this deal when they did the wrong evaluation on a picture. So what do they do? The issues around that are what? How secure is the network? Is that OTP really coming from a supermarket? Are you confirming to the supermarket? Is that correct? When you are confirming, is that not a hacker? Is, is, that, is that guy who is sending me a message to say, Major, this code, this, that. Are there no people stealing from your account? Those are issues that come around. The security is around the, the, sec the security is around the guy delivering. The security is around the reorder levels. The is it not a fake alarm that your system has been invaded in your house and all levels for merge and sugar and everything is now gone down and today you are paying? Are you sure of the security? So the bank becomes a key player. The telecoms come and become a key player. The security around your infrastructure becomes a key player. The insurance becomes the master. If you lose everything, you must be up to stage to be able to claim. When you lose it, 
they will bring their people to analyze. And the Kunya Islands are assessors. So technically, they are also assessors to say, well, this guy is paying the subscription. Is this so fairly and diversity? You have to get the you have to share the same. Okay, everything, okay. They are up to script. It was a, a genuine anchor. So that's what happens when the internet. There's so much, there's one dispense, I think, is the next slide. Oh, this is not the, this is the one, the machine to machine that the telecoms last year. Last year. The, uh, the, the one for medical is somewhere in this one. Very interesting. Where you now, your doctor, you can either want to have a connection to your doctor on your WhatsApp to send to so that's what I'm the doctor prescribes the medicine. Says, okay, the medicine, what time is it? This is 2 a.m. Okay. Drive onto the automatic medicine dispenser machine. And you pay the electronic. Alright? You pay, you live next to a complex, you can drive there or you can use this Uber driver to even pick up the medicine, take it to your place, get it delivered. <coughs> Obviously, when you, your doctor confirms that you need this medication, he says, yes, the money is deducted from your CMOS. Uh, your, your medical claim is instant, it's deducted there, and obviously comes out of your bank, and then it pays the driver who is going to deliver the medicine, and then it gives them a code to go in and key in on the automatic medicine dispenser. Key is in 142366. Okay, my comes out, my antibiotics delivers with the address, gets to the address, put in the tape, the, the, the mark strip. Read it confirms correct, opens, then you get your medicine. And all these complexes are now, if you now see CTV, so you see all the activity that is happening. So, technology is going to make it very difficult for things to steal in future. Somebody is saying, ah, it's not going to make it. It's coming. <laughs> all right? So, that's, the, that's how Internet of Things is. You know, once you have such a database of honest people that buy every time, every month, you're going to have to protect that data. You're going to have to predict, there's a company in Zimbabwe called Take Something Something that say we sent to 45,000 emails. Have you seen that? Have you ever noticed the, the, guy, the guys, they've written him? They've got a database of 45,000 emails. If you want to do an event or a course, you have to pay them $100 so that they send to those clients. Huh? If I can budge into that data, the pin of If I can budge into the data, they will not achieve. You it. Your 3 million subscribers which is uh, giving you a lot of money, all right? That's the interconnectivity of things, um, social networks, you get the, get the GPS, you get the internet, you get everybody is connected everywhere. And that is big, bringing us the nature of the data that needs to be stored somewhere. Uh, all right, do we have uh, any questions there before I check this slide? I think I have demystified the Internet of Things. You will go through this, this uh, slide you will be <coughs> Can I change? I think I can change from... <coughs> All right, let's go to the final slide. Which is the final three. We better get to the business of the day. I was just trying to make people understand that you cannot live alone, you cannot live on your own. There's machine to machine communication, etc., uh, etc. Et and within those connect connections from point A to point B, there is need to have security. We must be secure because there are people that are coming, there are hackers, there are viruses, there are people who just want to steal your data, there are people that will make deny you service denial of service, you want to pay for your school fees, you try to log into your account, it says wrong password, wrong username, somebody has already punched into your machine. And you are trying to order something from a very fast supplier in the US, you are trying to log onto your account and you are denied service and your shop does not have that particular uh, product for that day, so you are going to lose sales. So there is loss of business on that day. So when there is loss of business and you have not insured by anybody, you will claim from no one. Huh? We have the airlines business. The airline system goes down 
for two hours, and so they are not booking. But really, there is some loss of income in it. If you go to the bottom line, yeah? Sure. Yeah, huh? yes. There is. There is some loss of income. I mean, uh, we, we make money out of... Uh, we make money out of data recovery, uh, Tau. We recover data, that is story. That is... Uh, well, that is lost. And uh, we make that money out of uh, one online connectivity that we have. If that link goes down, I'm losing money. We lose money. We will complain to the pest, to the, to, to, to the ISP, and uh, because there's loss of revenue, and because we are not insured on that link, we cannot claim it. All right. Self disclaimer. I'm just going to go straight into cyber security. Um, I think what I, what I'd like people to do, guys, is for, especially the finance managers that are in here, is to go and get this book, Financial Management of Cyber Risk. It's a very good book. I know that they say if you want to hide something from an African, put it in a book. I think we are to read. I tell you something we read. Go and read this book, guys. Uh, it's got CFO strategies on cyber. This is called uh, you know, legal compliance strategies, communication. Very good book. I uh, gave it by online. Uh, yeah. Do I need cyber liability insurance from a technical perspective? What is cyber space, cyber risk, cyber safety? We have talked about that, just uh, in a kind of a rush. And I think the captions around that is the awareness and the relevance to the Zimbabwean market. Does it really matter here in Zimbabwe? Do I need this? Do I need cyber insurance in, in Zimbabwe? For what? It depends on the nature and the type of business you are. But I think when you understand your technology setup, you will definitely require it. But the honest guy, this guy just picked your email address from phishing on the net. So you are a very uh, good guy who wants to help this guy. But in the meantime, you've got 400,000 dollars in your account. So you complete your name, you send him your bank, your bank account, your bank account. You only got 400 grand. How much more do you want to make? <laughs> so he says, this is what he, how he talks to me, so the way I'm talking to you, the story. So he says, you give us your details, you send them back to us. What we do is we take all the money. I say, why? Abu, he says, because we steal from the grid. <laughs> <laughs> They've been attacked on the cyber because they are they are greedy. Oh, this this is the the next presenter on on the show. Oh, thanks for here on time. At least you can support me. <laughs> <laughs> I think industrial leadership is called on for cyber awareness and people who operate within cyberspace. I think a new generation of uh, ICT is coming where computer components and systems in the engineering field, they've become connected and embedded. For example, the example I was, I was just telling you now about buying. There are a, a number of people now who operate with chips within their fingers. You get a chip, you, you have it for two months or three months, then you remove it. Uh, anybody from the government of Zimbabwe? Anybody, nobody? A lot, you know, now, the tracker, the tracker now, it's safe. You get insured that if you get any infection or something, you, you get our chip in you and wherever you are and whatever you are doing, and whether you are on the mission or not, we are able to tell on the orbit and see your exact location. So if you take a, a data which is vicariously unliable, which is outside our defined because you are bound to pay. Uh, and that these embedded systems, they are now getting embedded in human beings. And there are certain tablets that now they have developed which, for example, I'm just giving you an example, uh, just out of this, the blues. You've got a BP, you get a, a, an electronic chip that gets in there which keeps regulating you so that your, your, your blood pressure doesn't go up or down. Instead of you rushing home to get tablets, you get an electronic chip that you get just to or whatever. That's, not, that's where technology is going. It's going to embedded systems. Systems that collect data from everywhere. So, months, so that chip will have all your details, your name, your cell, your address, your account number. It's, part, it's paramount where to get the money. And, and, and <laughs> so, so if I break onto that link and steal that information, 
and get my chip, which is artificial or a virtual chip, to be fed from your chip every day. I'm feeding from your account. All right, so that's lots of medical information, your health information identity. Uh, and, and we see in the next generation computing uh, advanced and secure computing systems and technologies. This, this area remains very critical, actually, for the guys from the telecoms, your machine to machine technology, your links, your security, where people still now have got systems that are called proprietary systems, systems that cannot interact with other systems. And, uh, and, and open systems has taken over now. And they are saying we are open, we will do everything. We know some networks in Zimbabwe here went under because they came up and they wanted proprietary devices, proprietary technologies. That's a thing of the past. Uh, all right, guys, the future of the internet. And all this is brought in industrial leadership, organizations that get involved in this and in robotics, in smart spaces. They, they, they make it. One, one nice link that I've seen in South Africa now is Uber. Your Uber, the driver. Huh? What Uber does is it's a, it's a union of drivers that you have to register. Your car has to be 2000, 2005 or so, a new car. So when you want a driver at the airport, you phone Uber. Uber will give you the driver that is closest to you. The driver will drive you to where the, 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 drive, the, the, the client you just enter your credit card number, right? So you pay straight to Uber. So the, the driver will just pick you up from point A to point B. So the driver does all his runnings around. If you've got a nice car, but a friend of mine who actually stopped working, he says he's getting 30,000 net runs a month from Uber. That's why the tax industry is fighting Uber and all that there. But what I want to say about Uber is, you send your credit card number. They deduct the money from your car. They will send a driver. The driver takes you to where you want. <coughs> now, how safe is the distance between you and the card? You and the card receiver, the payment receiver, the bank, the Uber guys. How safe is this link? If I can break into this link and know your credit card number, I can do wonders with it because I'm a millionaire. That's why you use Uber. <laughs> do you get it? Do you get it? In that technology connects people from point A to point B. Technology makes people access data. Technology makes people utilize data. Technology makes people behave with data. But one critical thing is safety. And technologically, you will never be ahead of the viruses, the guys who develop the software. You will never be ahead of the hackers. You will never be ahead of the people who have the ability to steal your information. So you always have a fallback position. All right, guys. Now we are getting into the Wi-Fi, voice over Wi-Fi. I'm happy with what Tel One is doing in town. I've seen some Tel One Wi-Fi environment. They are making the whole city so that we can communicate. But the question that really, uh, remains is what happens uh, a few years ago. I remember when we we started. I used to work for them. I worked in a bank for about 15 years. Uh, we were working for, we were setting up Kingdom Bank at that time. I know there's nothing easy, but I can prove it. And uh, we were sitting at, behind the Zebra. This, this is a discount company. We're sitting there. And I think just above the road there was a commission that's bank, what was it called? Metro. So that time we had a regulated and, and, and unregulated bank where we could just put in our and communicate my modems. Eh? communicate our data. It was not really regulated. Like now we have got this uh, 1,200 megahertz, this 800 megahertz was my CDMA, and this low band. So we were working in an unregulated band. That's why there were so many masts. You put your, 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 your mast this side, you put your mast this side. But what happens is if your AC power is smaller than mine, if I get there, I put a 40 watt, you have got a 15 watt. I will overshadow you. And that's what we did, we overshadowed Metropolitan. In 15 minutes time, we see all the banking transactions for Metropolitan coming into Kingdom Bank like that. All of them, we saw the network. That can happen if you don't have a secure network, even if you go onto a Wi-Fi environment. So you must be very careful. How secure is this? What encryption level, what security level is there? Is it secure? 
is WhatsApp saying, I, WhatsApp is, 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 is heavily used in Southern Africa, in Africa. Do you know that? Do you know that? That's why Mr. Pistorius was uh, in trouble with his WhatsApp. They just got it like that. All the messages to live. But I'm not saying stop using WhatsApp. But it's <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. I'm not talking about machine to machine. I think we have talked about that. Uh, the market is fragmented, guys. I think there's a lot of pandemonium that is taking place in this. But what I like about you have seen what is happening with these phones, with these smartphones, uh, and all that. That this this charger that goes here is almost a national charger now. Goes on to Samsung. Goes on to this uh, phone from Dubai. Goes on to this uh, phones uh, from China. Eh? Huh? And that's what a smart device manufacturer does. But we know we still have iPhone, Apple. They still want their chargers to be unique. They'll be left behind. <laughs> because what I now need is a charger. And the next thing is a phone. And the next thing is a phone that is a smartphone. And the next thing is a secure smartphone. At the moment, I know there was some cyber theft that was taking place at Simas. I was reading in the paper, Simas has now come up with a new uh, security where you pin, you have to put in your OTP. You've seen that in the paper. I saw that at Fed. They're trying to tell people that you can, your data is now safe, doctors can only claim on you. But how safe is that network? Who has tested it? Was there any penetration done? How many organizations sitting in this room do penetration testing at least once in six months? How many? You've never, you said that network is sitting up there. Eh? I went into a bank yesterday to open an account. Opened an account, I took my gadget. I didn't bring it. And, and as soon as I entered in there, before I signed my card, it went bim, 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 bim. It was telling me that this network is not, it's not secure. So the bank manager says, what, what is it? I said, no, don't worry, I'll tell you. At the end I said to him, your network is not secure. He says, well, I said, okay, let me show you the banking transactions that were taking place. Not, not the amount, but the transaction list. <laughs> I said, but don't worry, you'll be fine. <laughs> uh, and the machine to machine complex. You know, we've got a network specialist, we've got a network risk, raving assurance, but who has tested that network? Do you have a certificate of compliance, completeness? Do you have it? You don't. All our executives. They, it, I don't want to sell, I'm not selling a forensic audit or forensic, I'm not selling that. What I'm selling, I'll tell you right away, and I'm selling you a ICT review and a sustainability assessment tool, which I'll sell to you $200 or so if you want it. That I can sell to you today because I got it. But I'm not selling you forensics, the stilt, a small stilt device, you can search it on the net like this. I take this stilt device. I put it in 90% of your devices here, you guys. I'll get all your information and tell you. 90% of you. Except, I think, people who work for Ernest & Young, maybe people who work for uh, the consulting firms and the security companies and maybe Econet and a few banks, not all of them in Zimbabwe. They have secured their machines. The rest you are not. I put in a steel, a steel device cost about 2,400. Right? I put it in on that just for three seconds. I've taken everything. You're not secure. If you lose that data, what happens? You claim. You claim, eh? You're not insured as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, current options are, are closed. I think uh, uh, this I talked about when I said, you know, guys must just wake up and start showing. I'm not going through. I thought here yeah, we had. We had some technical guys. I, w I just wanted to demystify your GPS and your Wi-Fi and how secure is this link sitting in here after looking at this medium and where the storage of all the big data for your industrial, your enterprises, your transport, your medical, all the information is sitting here before it comes out there. But it gets moved from machine to machine. I just wanted to, to demystify and just praise Linux. Uh, they are good way in terms of all safety operating systems, but it's not necessary for this user. So, no, no. But technologies are going up, guys. Generally, mobile internet booming from 850 million to 
2015, 1.8 billion. We expect the rollout of networks worldwide to increase. We know that Zimbabwe has closed up on uh, licensing more networks, but we don't have a virtual network in this country. I'm sure somebody clever is going to ask for a license for a virtual network. Anyone from Porters? Virtual network requests haven't come through. People who want to ride on existing networks, like our Richard Branson in South Africa. Huh? Nobody wants to hop on these networks. You use all the infrastructure for the three networks and, and, and license, get license and pay rental fees. Nobody has come with that proposal. We are still working on it. You are working on regulating it, yeah. but you have received proposals. Yeah. Zimbabweans are smarter. They would have done that, I know. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so you can't really, you can't really start thinking of putting in a huge node like the uh, the, the the ones the existing ne networks. Like, and then, and then, pick it back on that node and just make sure you have a secure billing system. Uh, 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 do we have a billing? Uh, uh, a, do you have a system that picks up refining? You actually pick the refining before the network. Yeah. Before the network picks it up. And if they don't come, then you find them. Mm. You're smart. <laughs> refining is I use a local number to phone an international number and I pay a local price. So a phone call that costs 60,000, I pay 4,000 to the network. But those guys who pick it up now, they have the system. So how secure is your network? Are you safe from refiling? My telecoms, I don't know. Are they telecoms companies? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so what happens is that if, 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 if there's a refiling and you didn't pick the refiling and they pick it up and they want to find you, you can claim from insurance if you're covered. A lot of guys from Lebanon, they do refiling. And a lot of Lebanese are here in Pakistan. Every day they are in town, they, they are phoning <laughs> at the back of the networks. And I'm so happy, Portras, you have a system that picks refining. And I know these networks, they've got network specialist security managers, you know, <laughs> AP, penetration <laughs> testers, certified Jagazen. <laughs> <laughs> but people still refine. I don't think we have so many refining in South Africa, do we? We really, I think we really are close to zero. Those, those are not MTM and Voda, they are bad news on that. Their security is unbelievable. It's, they'll pick you up. When they pick you up, they pick your location, they take you, take you for litigation. Because <laughs> that's fraudulent. But we, we need that from Portras, we need that orbit, we need that kind of, we need, we need it. And I was talking to my friend here who was saying that they want to computerize this and that. Uh, I know that the, the statistics that you normally send to the Reserve Bank, the top 20 depositors, you know that, that list of 20 stats. If the Reserve Bank decides, in fact, I don't want to give that example. I want to give the example of your RTGs, the real time. Is that secure? Is that thing secure? Is that system secure? Because it's, it's 50 percent, 70 percent manual, 30 percent electronic. Is that? That's why it's. If they make it right, through and through electronic, people are bound to break in and get a list of the guys. Vanita as Arati Jima Wombe, and get the back of their account. By the day you realize with Mariam Bebu, it will have gone through Switzerland. And you need insurance to be covered. I mean, the insurance guy is going to talk more, so he's here, so I'm here. Growth with global trends, look at that, volumes of data worldwide. You can't really manage this kind of data without big data analytics. You can't really monitor this without systems that continue to monitor that electronically. All right, I told you about buying from anywhere, your, the, the electronic uh, custard of the electronic uh, coffee. We've had so many of these examples. All right? This one, the exciting one was about the patient in the hospital. 
the dispenser for the pills and where the doctor is sitting uh, and, and, and it's all connected how safe are these links before it gets there can, can somebody break in and send the wrong instruction and get the wrong benefit or get the wrong amount the globalization of applications is, is really you can't there are attacks on the networks on security privacy um, I think we have talked about preventing data theft maintaining productivity because once you don't have the data you can't produce cyber terrorism and uh, twatting of identity theft where I can, identity theft happens a lot in South Africa I'm sorry to say that but it does it still and uh, you get your passport uh, in my friend uh, I listen, I put, uh, I just remove your face, I leave all the details, I travel, I open an account with it, and I get a big loan, whatever, and uh, then, then I disappear, and then they will look for you. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, the number of trends in a state where security is becoming increasingly difficult, speed of attacks, sophistication of attacks, faster detection of weaknesses, disability attacks, and difficulties in patching. Patching basically these are programs that are developed by the security experts to try and stop the hackers or the people or the perpetrators. Latest trends, we have had a lot of malware, which are your viruses, your pause attacks, uh, getting your pause algorithm and, and, and just emulating the headshots and stealing the money. Cyber S is stealing money online. It's like your S, the one that happens on the road, you know, did you? The one when they steal money from a vehicle carrying cash, they do in the south. It's just called the haste. It's called the haste. Yeah? This one. This, this don't happen here, they happen in South Africa. Where they go, they, they deliver the vans, they load the ATMs, they do this, they move money. So these guys just come in the convoy and then they put a 35 in front of the brakes or it hits this truck from the side. They want money. Now that has been stopped by this ink that you. When you hit it in a, in a manner like that, that is bashing, there is a pressure that then comes out of the, uh, the canisters where the money is stored and it comes up just like your airbags. So the whole money is in ink. So once you get it, if a policeman sees with you train runs in a, that blue ink, it means you are, if you destroy it. But they have not stopped. They have gone to, to make money, to make uh, ink that washes. <laughs> what you it? So, you really, you, we are sitting here, people are busy. Alright, cyber, yes, these are, uh, you know, once you are, you are trying, you are trying to pay wire transfer to Zurich and somebody budgets in and redirects that transfer to their account in South Africa. And that's where AML becomes key, or anti-money laundering uh, experts, and then they, they should, should be able to trace that. And that's why Basel, Basel become also key on, on how you manage your assets. But I'm not talking about anything. security, integrity, availability, and access. This is key for me, authenticity. And it should be closed out. You guys should do your ICT review and asset and ability assessment once in three months. All right? We know IT security. We need, we need this assurance. We are told we are secure. We need to know the applications are secure. Our data is secure. If this is all not secure and you are not sure, you fall back is insurance. All right? This cyber extortion, terrorism, electronic money. I'm sure this guy will talk after me. I'm going to go through this in detail. I think what is key is here. I think if there is somebody going to talk about regulatory actions, governance, and compliance, and how safe are we? I mean, I'm, 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 I was just demystifying virtual, uh, virtualization here of security and say, even on each operating system level, your kernel may not be secure. The attackers will attack your model. They will attack your real core operating system. They will attack, you know, they will, these guys, they will sit beyond the bootloader, which is your MI. All right? So they will go everywhere. Um, I think what, what is really exciting is the uh, fear and uncertainty and doubt that cyber is bringing to us. How am I doing on time? Hmm? I'm, I'm good. You don't know how many slides are coming. <laughs> <laughs> what if there are 300? <laughs> All right. The, uh, and uh, and uh, the future, I think cyber security will become a scientific discipline. 
It will be an application and technology centric. It will be a requirement. And uh, cyber security will never be solved, but it will be managed. If somebody comes to you, your MD walks in and addresses staff and say, we have solved cyber risk issues. Raise your hand and say, excuse me, say, you are lying. <laughs> so what happened? Attack bed will be an integral part of cyber security. Uh, this, um, I'm, if you have seen it, all oh, stuff that is not mine, I'm acknowledging it. I'm compelled to do that because it's, it's not my origination. All right? I think there are issues these guys will talk about uh, liability for monetary damage, etc. You know, e business income loss, cyber extortion, e vandalism. I think the guys, the presenters that are coming after me will talk about this. Denial of service. We talked about this earlier on that you are trying to do your business, you are trying to do something, but this is distributed denial of service. All these guys, cloud. And they, they, because of that, they can do business. They lose money. This will need insurance cover. I'm sure they will cover that. Uh, this, these are dynamics of distributed uh, uh, okay. cyber liability risks. Threatens our data. There's extortion. There's network damage. I think I'm going to talk about this denial of service. But this is where the crime is, and you are insuring yourself against this crime. I know you insure, you insure yourself against people stealing your cars. They can impact on machine-to-machine -machine infrastructures. Look at this. They hit the server. They go on, they hit the router, which is supposed to be our routing traffic interceptor and intercepting everything. They hit your antennas, all the young antennas. Young antennas are in trouble for the network, the yes. All the gateways are open. They hit your sensor networks, and they come to a device. So your application is in trouble. Your network domain is gone, and your machines cannot connect. The business is crumbled. And they work on this. This guy developed this software to do this, and they do it whether you like it or not. They do it on Yahoo, they do it on Amazon, they do it on CNN. You know, if your computer is not secure, sometimes you log on to a site, you want to look for something, you put an advert that is coming. Huh? And then, you, you, and, and, then, and then what do you do? You decide to do internet banking on the same machine. Eh? You log on to your bank and you put in your pin and your password. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's fine. You can continue. I'm not saying don't do internet banking. Just check out security. <laughs> Next day you do a transaction and you don't get an OTP request and three minutes elapses, call your insurance. <laughs> Eh? Eh? Oh, what's your bank balance? <laughs> just start going down like <laughs> And you are really sure. It's, it's hectic, guys. Uh, we spend money on IT security. A lot. We should spend money on insurance. What do we do? I mean, I will say to myself, if we are conscious about security, we should be conscious that this security is not who has got a security in their company that is 100% resilient and safe and secure? Root of Zichka Network. There's always residual risk as long as people are involved. People, that's what I'm trying to say. It's safe. But when, when you bring people over, it's a dynamic machine. These are some of the uh, losses that people have suffered. I'm sure these guys will talk about these things. Financial fraud. Telecom fraud, sabotage, denial of service, theft of proprietary information, information that you think is yours alone. And this impact on business in a manner that you will hear from, from other presenters or, or we can talk about that in the discussion. Breaches, bottom line suffers. Reputation suffers. Rectification process is costly if you've lost your data. Companies have cyber risk. All companies have cyber risk. There are two types of companies. Those that have had a security breach and those that don't know. 
and they don't have they, they, and they, they don't know they have had a breach. They say we are in the year of learning a lot of things, and we are learning a lot of things. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me this morning to welcome um, our second speaker, uh, Mr. Ryan Dunn. Now, that name again. <laughs> Ryan Van de Kubik. Did I get that right, Ryan? Right? Yeah. Uh, allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome Ryan, uh, Ryan Van de Kubik to the podium as he takes us through his presentation. Ryan is a uh, director at Cycast. Uh, which is an underwriting agency specializing in cyber risk insurance. You tell us more about this company and what they do. Ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, welcome uh, Ryan and our first one. What is cyber insurance? How does it address those risks? And what sort of cover does cyber insurance typically provide? So to start off, just to give a couple of statistics on what the real cyber risk translates into. So for 2014, there was a total of 974 estimated million records which were compromised. That equates to roughly 31 records per second. A uh, record could be anything from your name, your contact details, your account number, etc. The estimated global annual cost of cybercrime is $400 billion. Um, South Africa, an estimated cost of $5.8 billion. A scary statistic is how long it takes an organization to identify a breach. So looking at 188 days, which roughly translates into six months before organizations are aware that the environment has been compromised and that there's an intruder who's been working around the environment. If you start to think how much data could have been exfiltrated out of that environment in that much time, how many potential areas could the intruder have put onto the network so that they can access it again later on, it's a very, very scary statistic. Coupled with that, 81% of organizations don't detect an incident themselves. They are notified via a third party, um, for retailers and stuff, often by their bank. So 81% of organizations don't pick it up themselves. Um, as a nation, cybercrime would be the 27th largest, based on GDP, and cybercrime turnover has now just eclipsed that of the illicit drug trade. To start off, I should take you through, well, basically the background. One of the problems we've got in the South African market at the moment is that companies are still very quiet about incidents which have occurred. So we don't have privacy legislation in place which enforces mandatory notifications or sort of coming, air, coming out and sort of airing the laundry about your incidents. So a lot of incidents in South Africa will follow the scenario we're going to run you through now where things are swept under the carpet. Um, thankfully for us, it is something which is changing. We've got uh, protection of personal information legislation which is due to come out of the course of the next year or so, and that will bring in mandatory notifications, etc. So not so long, in a, uh, long ago, in a land not so far away. Here we have our MD at not, not a big deal retailers. Friday afternoon, half past four, MD gets a call from a client saying, They've seen some funny activity in their account and they suspect that maybe there's been an incident. Fifteen minutes later, MD just got off the phone, he receives another important call, being a Friday afternoon, it's his mate, they're going out for a couple of drinks after work. You can't call about the breaches, back of mind, he's going off to enjoy the weekend. Come Monday morning, 9 o'clock, back at the customer's office, she has now heard nothing back from the MD. I rate and now seeing transactions going off of her account. She phones and demands feedback to find out what's going on, what have they done, has her data been compromised. The MD decides, well, it's probably worth investigating, gets hold of his IT department to take a look into this and see whether or not they've actually been breached. IT spent the day looking into things, pick up 100,000 client records of being compromised. At this point, they realize they're in trouble. Tuesday morning, the MD takes the probably not wise move of trying to smooth things over with the client, gives her a shot and says, well, there's no concrete proof that it was ours, but you're an important client, so what we'll do is we'll split the cost to you that you've had going into account 50-50. Unsurprisingly, the client is not particularly enamored with that, and she then goes to a friend of hers and publishes um, news of the breach and how it's been managed onto social media, news websites, etc. The aftermath, and these are the things which clients don't necessarily contemplate or realize happens in the event of a breach. Call center is flooded with clients left and right phoning to find out has their details been used, are they at risk, what next, what is the company doing to protect them, and what can they do to protect themselves. An attorney sees the article in the newspaper, decides to initiate a class action suit against the retailer, 
further consequences as the uh, breach the initial investigation was just handled by the internal IT department and not a proper forensic investigation firm. Any information they gathered will not be uh, admissible in court. They probably jeopardized the legitimacy of that evidence. They've got escalated legal bills and their market share is plummeting. Some customers are more traded than others. They are now a target for hacktivists who are looking to make a statement and try and sort of teach MVD retailers a lesson. So let's just take a quick recap and look back at some of the risks which are posed by information security. First off, you've got the potential reputational damage, the system unavailability and downtime, loss of revenue, data, competitive advantage, litigation arising from compromised data, costs incurred in responding to an incident, so you've got legal defense and settlement for later liability claims, forensic investigation costs, affected party notifications and remediation, public relations costs, crisis communications, and potentially industry regulatory fines and penalties. It's also important to remember that depending on which industry you are participating in, there could already be regulatory and industry fines and penalties. Most of those will probably be the payment card industry with their PCR fines and requirements. So how the situation would have unfolded if NPD retailers had a cyber insurance policy? What we'll do now is we'll walk through a breach response process and just touch on the areas where a cyber insurance policy would come in and what the typical costs would be that would pick up. Okay, let me know if you can't hear me, it's just easier, that thing is like louder than softer. So after the breach occurs, you'll then contact your insurance provider and uh, say to them, listen, we suspect there's been a breach or we've been notified that there is a breach. First point of call will often be a legal provider who will give you insight into what are the regulatory requirements, what actions do you need to take to ensure that you don't fall foul of any sort of regulatory requirements. Um, you'll often find your legal providers that assist you with any representations you need to make to these regulatory bodies and that's important to prevent yourself getting yourself into even deeper or hotter water than you already are. The legal providers also get involved with any later liability claims that you may have from the affected, fire, affected parties, your business associates who may be damaged their reputation in dealing with you or impact to their environment. Net Diligence, so a partner of ours out of America, they do an annual claim study where they take statistics from actual claims, typically out of the American market, and analyze those to see what are the average costs one experiences in a breach, what are the typical causes of breaches, etc. Working from their claim study from last year, the legal advice and privacy notification regulations vary between zero and two and a half million dollars. So it's not sort of insignificant amounts of money. Bear in mind that that's got nothing to do with the defense and settlement of those claims. It's literally just the legal advice costs. Once you've got the legal advice, you then look to um, deploy your containment and forensic investigation teams. It's very important to have these sorts of services because your containment team is going to go in to try and contain the incident and prevent the further leakage of data. So let's say, for example, you've got an ongoing attack and people are copying data out. You've then got the ability to go and restrict where they can access, block off sensitive data so that the trackers can't access that data and try and manage how much data is flowing out of your environment. The forensic investigation is very important because they would look to establish how did the breach occur, whereabouts on your environment have the intruders actually move around, so where do you need to now go to try and clean up the environment and try and block their access. The intruders are typically quite clever. What they'll do is when they get access onto an environment, they'll then, <clears throat> instead of copying data out of the environment straight away, they'll move around to try and elevate their privileges, find and map the network to see where data resides, um, Establish other mechanisms that they can get to access the environment later on. So you may, that's to cover in case you pick up that, oh, okay, somebody has got in access over there. We change that and we patch that system. They'll typically find other ways that they can then get access to your environment. It's also very important in that the forensic investigation will look to establish which systems, what data, the nature and volume of that data has actually been compromised. So let's say, for example, you've got a database of 10,000 clients, but through this attack, only 100 of those clients have actually been exposed. You don't want to be going to the press or to these 10,000 clients and say, oh, potentially you've been affected. You'd rather try and limit your response to just the 100 individuals who have actually been affected. The important thing with the forensic investigation as well is that the evidence they collect will be admissible in court. 
Um, it's vital that you get professional professionals in to do your forensic investigations and that you properly prep your IT security teams that they don't inadvertently jeopardize or compromise that information. So one of the worst things you can do in the sort of midst of a breach is reboot the systems, switching the monitor off. A lot of the potential evidence you have would be sitting in memory and that would then be lost. Um, looking at the net diligence claim study again, <coughs> forensic investigation costs vary between zero and one and a half million dollars. A typical find in the South African market, okay, with well the South African exchange rate being what it is, is that you can typically take these numbers and multiply, multiply them by around 10. So they, they're fairly accurate as to what the typical costs are. The next step in the process, once you've now established who's affected, what data is affected, is to actually go out to, to the affected parties and notify them what has happened so that they can be in a better position to A, protect their own identities and you can look to put in place services to try and protect them as well as try and maintain their confidence. So as a, a typical sort of um, client of a company, you would much rather have that an organisation comes to and says, we've had an incident, this is what happened, we are going to offer you the following remediation services to try and limit potential damage to you. So that could be something like credit identity theft monitoring, whereby you'll be registered with a credit union, and then when anybody goes to try and open up a credit account in your name or a clothing account and stuff, you receive a notification so you can block that account before it's run up to the hills, you've now got that retailer knocking on your door asking you why you got bad debts, you've got to try and clear your negative credit record and it becomes a bit of a nightmare. So it's an important step to maintaining the client confidence as well as limiting the potential reputational damage which you could, uh, could be victim of later on. Um, like I said, they're also keeping down the, uh, the liability claims and your reputational damage. I think maybe to just sort of expand on the reputational damage. Again, there, if you've got notifications, so there's going to be reputational damage to sending out notifications to say we've been breached and these thousand people are affected. But that's going to be far less if you leave it. It comes out later on down the line that you were breached, these thousand people were affected, and now these people have got sort of bad debts in their names, you've kept quiet about it and you haven't notified them. So that's, it's really critical to manage that part of, of the process to look after your own identity, your own reputation as such. Um, net diligence claim study, those costs vary between zero and $6.15 million. Again, obviously a big factor in that is how many people were affected and which remediation services you're offering. There are also economies of scale to be garnered from that, so with these providers you'll often find registering a thousand users is going to cost you X, but if you're registering 10,000, it obviously starts working out of a cheaper per user. Public relations campaign, often more, more often than not run sort of concurrently with the customer's notification support function, just to ensure that you've got a consistent message going out to market as to what's happened, how you've been affected, and what you're doing to actually manage the situation itself. Um, again, important to solicit experienced professionals in this who have actually been down that road before. Responding to a breach is a very stressful situation and you don't necessarily want to be throwing in newbies and hoping that they can sort of find out at that point if they'll sink or swim. Um, looking at the study again, PR costs vary between zero and $135,000. There's a lot of elements which will come into the crisis management. You could have things like media training, so training of a spokesperson to actually stand up in front of an audience and say, listen, this is what's happened, without sort of making bigger problems for the company. Uh, implementing things like call centers are often overlooked, so cyber insurance. <coughs> the name cyber insurance is probably, it's not the greatest name for the product, but it's the name that's been coined internationally, and you know, cyber is a bit of a sexy word, it's really always in the media and stuff like that. But it's probably best thought of as information or data breach insurance. Because that's really where the information, where the policy kicks in and comes to its own. Provides cover for information and network security breaches. Effectively looks to transfer breach response function to your insurer. Is specifically tailored to address intangible property and non-physical perils. We'll touch a little bit later as to where cyber differs from a lot of your traditional products, which are more focused towards your physical and tangible perils. Provides first and third party cover. What does cyber insurance cover? And we've touched on some of this briefly recently, and it's nice to, as we run through this, tie it back to the Deloitte video we just saw. And you can see how, in the response to that incident and into that breach, 
how the cover then ties in and covers a lot of the elements relating to that process. So it covers the expenses of your IT specialists, as we said, those would be the guys to come in and try and contain the breach, bring the operations back up and running. Attorneys to guide you as to what you need to do from a regulatory standpoint, as well as defend you for your later liability claims. Forensic investigators to determine what happened, what data was compromised, who compromised it, how do we go about sorting out and cleaning up this environment. Loss adjusters who will then obviously assist with your business interruption claims. And the aim of those specialists would be to contain, manage and recover from an incident. Your crisis management expenses, your PR campaign to try and minimize the reputational damage, notifications to affected parties, mediation services, so that could be credit monitoring is really the most common example. Um, I actually had, I was doing a radio interview the other day and somebody asked me, if you were looking at the Ashton Madison breach, what could you do there? So yes, credit monitoring for the, the lost card details and stuff like that, but there's other things one could do. Potentially there you could offer marriage counseling or something like that to affected parties. Um, <laughs> the ensuing litigation we mentioned, data <coughs> services recovery is covered under cyber insurance. Uh, business interruption, so that could be, for a multitude of things, it could be while systems are down in your investigation and restoring operations. It could be an e-commerce website which is hit by a distributed denial of service attack and is unavailable and you've got lost income as a result of that. Then potential fines and penalties to the extent insurable by law. <coughs> Uh, the Psychi Cyber Insurance Policy is split up into three insuring modules. They can be selected, you can choose your combination of them, and there can be some limited as to what suits the client best. Um, my personal recommendation is to take all three elements of the cover because it provides you with the most holistic solution to manage your, your incident and have an effective response. So looking at the Data Recovery Business Interruption Module, this provides coverage to respond to a loss of income and operating expenses experienced due to a network security breach. Uh, it covers the expenses of specialists, investigators, digital forensic auditors, loss adjusters to determine the scope, cause, extent of any theft or unauthorized disclosure of information or privacy breach, as well as costs to restore, recover data and operations for costs incurred until such point in time where established that data cannot be recovered or restored. Um, I know there was a question earlier relating to the data recovery. So, the cover does kick in up until a point where it's established that that data cannot be recovered or restored. Um, it's also interesting to see how the business interruption ties into that side of things because typically one would try and have as redundant an environment as you can, be that through backups or um, redundant processing sites, etc., so that you can minimize your potential data loss should you have an incident and roll over as effectively as possible. The cover does also then provide the business interruption which will be triggered in when you're looking to recover over to your backup or your remote processing site. Uh, the benefits of the data recovery business interruption module, so the access to the specialist to contain, restore operations and investigate the nature and extent of the breach. And I know I've harped on this a bit, but it's really pivotal that you, in that situation, have best of breed to try and manage the situation. There's no good in, well, we've got a fairly decent IT department or my friend down the road, he studied IT, so he can probably manage it and stuff. You're just going to cry in the long run and it's going to end up costing you a lot more and your reputational, except your reputational damage, etc. will be exponentially worse off. Um, the BI cover does not require physical or tangible damage, so often data is seen as being intangible or non-physical and is excluded from most policies. And you've then got reasonable cover for increased cost of working. So if you need to move to an alternate processing facility, hire new equipment, you've got staff over time as you try and recover your data and operations, it's also covered under the policy. The second insuring module is your crisis management and notification expenses. So that provides coverage for the cost to respond to a security failure or privacy breach. The response costs could include notification expenses, cost to provide remediation services uh, to customers affected third parties, as well as your public relations and crisis management expenses. Coming under there would also be things like the call centers, if you're going to do media training, if you're going to have a newspaper advertisement or an email campaign or SMS campaign or a Facebook campaign to try and sort of look after your reputation. <coughs> Benefits of this module, the PR campaign which is mentioned, your notification to affected parties, remediation services to credit monitoring. And one of the nice things with the SciGuys policy is that it doesn't require the policyholder to be legally obligated to notify the affected parties. 
So we believe in sort of taking the proactive step. So we give our insurers the opportunity to elect to do notifications. They don't have to be required to do so by law. Another reason is I do feel that it has, well, history shows that it has quite a big impact on your reputational damage as well as your um, later liability claims. Then cyber liability, which is the one that comes to mind most regularly, provides coverage for the third party claims due to failure of the insured's network security or failure to prevent unauthorized access to personal information. The coverage will also be provided for associated regulatory fines and penalties to the extent it's your by law. And I know we are going to touch on the regulatory landscape later on, so we will see how this ties in there. Benefits cover for intangible events such as data and uh, events and assets such as data. The coverage is provided for internal or external source of incident, so it needn't just be some talented hacker who is hacking to your systems from externally. There is also cover for rogue and malicious inside employees, third party service providers, etc. Uh, it covers deliberate malicious as well as under certain circumstances accidental acts, which results in an incident. And I'll touch more on the accidental acts when we get to the triggering events for the cover. So looking at cyber versus some traditional insurance policies. Okay, so professional indemnity policy provides limited cover for loss of third party data, but only if it relates to the provision of professional services. Also, you won't have any of those proactive costs coming in, so your investigations, your notifications, your PR campaigns, etc. wouldn't be covered under that. General liability policy, data is deemed to be an intangible form of property, therefore it's typically excluded from those policies. The business interruption policy typically requires material damage, data again is seen as intangible, non-material damage and would not be included. Computer auras cover, so that includes costs for repairing damaged hardware and lost data, but only as a result of physical peril. So if your server for example burns out or, or something along those lines, not as a result of a hack or a data breach. And then if a data guarantee policy or commercial grant policy covers financial loss but only as sustained by the insured. So you won't have the liability from third parties or clients whose money has been stolen who, or whose identities have been compromised. Any questions on the coverage gaps? I know it's, it's sometimes one where people are in the South Africa market, I know it's an area where there's a lot of questions around are there potential overlaps in cover, where does the cyber go, etc. Yes? Uh, where would we this uh, in card fraud? Sorry? Card fraud, where would we miss it? <coughs> where would you see card fraud? Mm -hmm. So card fraud you would typically find coming up under your cyber when you've got your liability claims later on. So those individuals who are affected with lost funds, they would then look to institute a liability claim against you for their lost funds. So that's where the cyber will pick it up. <coughs> okay, so looking at some incidents. Triggering events. So there's two key events which trigger the cyber insurance cover. Uh, a network security breach and a privacy breach. So the network security breach, I touched on earlier the downstream attack. So if a compromise to your environment impacts a business partner or a third party through transmission of malware or the like to their environment, you would then have cover. Um, unauthorized access is fairly self-explanatory, so it's unauthorized access to data, a malicious individual who has now got access to data which they should not have. Unauthorized use would provide cover as well, so let's say your environment is compromised and is used to launch an attack against somebody else. So quite often what they'll do for a distributed denial of service attack is the intruders will they'll almost build up a bit of an army. So they'll compromise different environments and then use all of those environments to target one target. Should your environment be part of that attack, there is cover as well. Uh, theft of data is fairly self-explanatory. Denial of service is where your systems or operations are affected because of a network security or cyber attack and you're unable to operate. Uh, malicious code is seen self-explanatory again. Physical theft is also covered for. So something which people often overlook is your laptop. In South Africa, the theft of laptops is rough. It doesn't matter if you've got them in the boot, the front of your car, the guys will steal it off of your back, I swear. Um, and a lot of people overlook what data is resident on your laptop. 
what data is relevant on your tablet, on your tablet, on your phone, etc. So theft of those sorts of devices is also covered under the policy because that could result in an incident. Um, the number of people I've spoken to who store passwords in spreadsheets on their laptops. So you may not have much information on your laptop, but if you've got a document like that, you could be giving away the keys to the kingdom and complete access to the corporate network. The privacy breach. This is an interesting one, and why the name cyber is probably not a great name for the product, because the privacy breach could be a result of lost physical hard copy data records. So if you've not shredded your physical paper records properly, and those are now lost or stolen, that could result in a privacy breach, and would be a claim on an event under a cyber insurance <coughs> So some common causes of incidents. Accidents and negligence. Unauthorized access, so that will be your hackers, your malicious software, rogue employees, and third party access are so four sort of key areas where incidents occur from. And there's a nice little cartoon just for a good chuckle. Uh, change all my passwords to incorrect, so whenever I forget, you can tell me your password is incorrect. <laughs> Accidents and negligence is consistently one of the biggest causes of cyber claims. Um, and like we touched on, lost and stolen devices. When you look at the percentage of people who don't secure their phones, so for example, don't have a pin code on their phone or, or the like, it's staggering and results in a lot of claims. Uh, insecure destruction of hardware and physical paper records, we just touched on. Unsecured Wi Fi hotspots. Uh, I'm not sure how prevalent this is in the Zimbabwe market, but in South Africa market it's becoming quite a big issue. So there's two real aspects to the Wi-Fi hotspots. <clears throat> One is what the guys are doing is they'll, for example, go to a coffee shop and set up their own Wi-Fi hotspot. So you'll then go, so Mug and Bean is a big sort of coffee shop chain in South Africa. You'll go to Mug and Bean, sit down, oh, free Wi-Fi, fantastic. Switch your device on, scan for what networks are available. Ah, oh, Mug and Bean, free Wi-Fi, fantastic. I connect, I've connected to the intruder's Wi-Fi. He now uses that to compromise my device. Uh, the other one is in particular with hotels actually in South Africa where the guys are compromising the hotel's Wi-Fi access and as part of the sort of welcome pack that you get there when you sort of log on where they'll give you information about the hotel, the facilities, etc. Click OK to get it and they're using that to then install malware onto people's devices. So there's actually a syndicate operating in South Africa and KPMG have just recently released a report on it that are operating widely in South Africa using Wi-Fi hotspots to compromise individuals. And the important thing to remember there is that if I compromise your device, I can use that later on to, corporate, uh, to compromise the network which it connects to. Um, another area to the Wi-Fi hotspots is how many of you use Wi-Fi in your offices or, or the like? So you've got your device set up and as you get to the office, sit down, automatically connects to the Wi-Fi, off you go. The way that works is when you're sort of with your device when it's switched on, it sends out a signal looking for that Wi-Fi connection. So it'll send out a request saying, is this Wi-Fi network available? You now get devices which listen for those request signals, will then pretend to be that Wi-Fi network. So they'll say, yes, here I am, you can connect to me. <laughs> she will send the password all nicely, let them go, yes, okay, that's fantastic. Whatever password you want to send me, I'm going to let you connect, and then it compromises you. So next time you leave the office, whatever the case is, it's probably wise to switch off your Wi-Fi. Accidental disclosure. Um, this is an interesting one, because who's ever sent an email to the wrong recipient? Depending on what information is attached to in that email, that could be a privacy breach. So imagine if you intended to send it to another colleague, whatever the case is, and you've got your client list in a spreadsheet which you send to the colleague but accidentally sent to another client or to a competitor or the like. Could be a little bit embarrassing. Uh, password reuse, complexity and storage. Thankfully, the Zimbabwe market is a lot more mature than the South African market. Because if I tell you how many times I've done a presentation and seen people take out their laptops, open them up, and they've got a sticky note with their password on it. You fall over that. It's scary. <laughs> Even I had a presentation about a year or so ago where we presented and we're talking about like simple passwords, the most common being password one, two, three, etc., and things like that. And one lady, I swear to you, said to me, ha, they'll never guess my password because it's tequila. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you 
just kind of told the room which part it was. <laughs> um, unattended devices unlocked is another one which people often overlook. So you're sitting in the office, working, when you get up and go grab something to drink or a coffee or something, don't lock your machine. If there's somebody there who is malicious or the like, they can then go and use that device to install malware, copy data off of it, send emails to somebody else, etc. So it's really important to lock your device when it's unattended. We'll run through some stats to give you a bit of context to what these sorts of things actually translate into. So this was a study which was done by Trustwave, who one of the forensic providers we use in the South African market. Um, and it's a study they did on employee seven deadly sins. So this is maybe a good thing to incorporate in a bit of sort of training back at the office to create awareness amongst staff to, to better equip their own security. There we go, the people with the sticky notes. So, um, so this is that 15% of employees stick their passwords onto their devices with the sticky notes. Uh, most common passwords, I'm sure we've all seen them, where it's sort of combinations of password, one, two, three, four, five, six, etc. Time and time again from these studies, when guys go and do the analysis and the forensic investigations, they find that a simple password to compromise. It seems such a simple thing to resolve, but time and time again, it's the root cause of an actual incident. So, I suppose the, the root, the sort of net effect of that is, attackers do not have to be particularly competent. They don't have to be particularly skilled. Inevitably, we make it easy for them to compromise us. Uh, keeping wrong, 71% of employees have reported that they've been able to walk past other people's devices and see information they're on, and one in three individuals doesn't lock their device when they leave it. USB stick up, and this was actually a little bit more insight into this USB stick up one. It was conducted at the US Department of Defense where Trustwave went around and sort of dropped memory sticks around the office with friendly malware on it, just to see who would plug it in. 60% of people who picked up those memory sticks plugged them into the device. They then checked to see what would happen when they put on a company logo, so for like a third party provider or a reputable organization, that number went up to 90%. We saw in the Deloitte video what that USB memory stick could do. And I'm sure there's probably going to be some people in the room who are going to give a second thought before they plug in the FPC memory stick in there. 35% <laughs> uh, of users report having experienced a virus detection through a USB device. Uh, phishing scans. These have evolved very far from an email from your cousin in Nigeria who's looking for money, etc. to specifically crafted emails which look completely legitimate where the guys have gone and done research via your social media, via your website, etc. to identify targeted individuals within an organization and craft emails which are legitimate looking and believable to them in order to compromise them. In fact, while we were sitting in the previous um, presentation, I got an email from Sanral who looks after the car train and stuff in South Africa saying that everybody needs to be wary because there's a massive fishing campaign going out of, um, around them and Probably on a monthly basis, you get emails from the different banks in South Africa warning all their clients about phishing scams. So these are rife and prevalent. 69% um, of security professionals so that they've seen phishing scam emails which are not being picked up by spam sort of trackers. 27% of organizations have executives who have been compromised by uh, phishing emails. And another interesting statistic is users trained in avoiding phishing and scam emails fall for these emails 42% less of the time than those who are trained. And there's easy things to look out for with a phishing email. Things like look at the URL, so more often than not the phishing emails are going to have a link within the email itself. Hover over the link, look where it wants to link to. If it doesn't look legitimate, don't click on it. If you're not really sure, Rather than click on that link, go to Google, look up the company that you wanted to go to, or browse to that company directly, and then interact with it from there. Don't trust the links in these sorts of emails. Um, I'm not sure of the banks in Zim, but I know back in SA, they've actually taken a stance where your bank, they, they have publicized that your bank will not send you an email with a link in it to try and prevent the phishing scams. Reckless abandon, 70% of users don't lock their mobile devices, which ties in nicely with 89% of users who pick up a mobile device will look to see if they can find any sort of sensitive or personal information on it. And let's be honest, everyone is nosy, so if you pick up a phone, who's not going to try and take a look and see what's on it? 
Maybe there'll be some interesting selfies. You never know. <laughs> uh, we touched on the Wi-Fi a little earlier, and then obviously social media. One needs to be a little bit wary of what you're putting on there, because often you could be putting on information which could be used in targeted phishing scams or targeted attacks later on. Right, unauthorized access. So hacking is obviously a big one. Malware, including mobile malware, so there's been a massive growth in mobile malware over the last couple of years. Samsung's are particularly sort of prone to be hit by that. But it doesn't mean that Apple is completely immune and we are starting to see Apple devices where there is sort of malware targeted specifically at iOS and the like. Um, social engineering attacks, like I said, those have come a long way. Um, and, uh, I mean, I remember, so before we started Psygast and stuff, I was in one of the big consulting firms, and the number of times we got emails saying, please ignore if so-and-so, if you get a call pretending to be a director from another office asking for assistance or a client list or things like that, because there's so many different ways these social engineering attacks manifest. So the guys who literally pretend to be a director out of office, please, I urgently need so-and-so's email address, can you give it to me? A lowly junior sort of consultant, whatever the like, is, gosh, okay, I don't want to tell the director no, and then hands over their information. Um, to phishing attacks, etc. So social engineering is rife and used very often in, in sort of compromising environments. Compromising of passwords, um, that's really not rocket science anymore. There are free tools on the internet which can be used to compromise passwords. Um, a fair example, which I have used in the past, would be Jack the Ripper. You can go and download Jack the Ripper from, for free off of the internet. It's got tutorials, user manuals, guidance. You can go online, they'll help you figure out how to use it. You can go onto YouTube and get detailed step-by-step -step videos on how to use Jack the Ripper to compromise passwords. And it's so easy to use. You literally take the password file, put it in, click decrypt, it runs and it looks to decrypt the passwords. Um, the way, maybe to give a background, the way these things work is they typically use what they call a rainbow table. So they have built up a database of common passwords, starting with password, password 123, 123456, etc. They build up that whole database and then they run it against the password hash to see if they can crack it and get what the password is. So it doesn't sound a particularly scientific method to use, but that's how they do it. And as computer processing power has increased over the years, so it's become easier to sort of launch these types of attacks. Uh, website attacks, there's a horde of these which are going on where guys are basically compromising websites in order to then compromise individuals who are visiting those websites. So we had drive-by watching hole attacks in the past where the guys would basically embed malware on a commonly used website. You would then go to the website and the machine would be infected. Um, a new one which is quite interesting and evolving is malvertising and there have been instances where the guys would go as far as placing what looks to be a legitimate advert on a common website. So for example, this clothing chain has got a big sale on, 75% off, click here to go to the website. You click on that, direction to the website which installs the malware and then direction to the legitimate website in any case. You get there, see the sales on and think, okay, well I've obviously missed the river, but your device has been so that's quite a new sort of commonly evolving uh, sort of threat vector. Rogue employees, <clears throat> this is one which is often discounted by individuals, um, but I know in particular the African market it is rough how much sort of corporate espionage and stuff is going on. It's, it's really, it's quite scary. Uh, so corporate espionage, uh, we've literally got instances in the South African market where companies will recruit individuals on the condition that they bring with them the client list. So we'll give you a job and pay you 30% extra on condition that you bring with you X, Y, and Z. Um, selling of sensitive personal data to competitors or on the underground markets. So data has value. And if you've got an employee who's a bit down on his luck, you know, times are tough, the economy is taking a bit of strain, it becomes quite tempting to sort of sell this information on to kind of line your own pockets. Um, selling of authentication credentials. So you may not want to get your hands dirty in actually stealing the data because maybe your environment has got data loss protection or something in place so they can track it back to you. Sell the credentials to a malicious individual and gosh, they must have hacked my password but I've still received the funds later on. 
uh, exploiting internal systems for own financial gain. Often insiders will understand the organization, how it works, which security mechanisms are in place, and can filch money out of organizations for extended periods of time and well hide their tracks and things like that, so it's difficult to pick up on it. Taking data along when leaving, I think there's many people who do that. So you've now worked in an organization for a couple of years and you feel that you've got you work hard on the stuff that you put together, you've got a right to take it with you when you leave. The problem is, as an original custodian of data, the organization remains responsible for the protection of that data. So if I, as an employee, employee leave a company, take data along with me, and let's say the external hard drive, for example, that I copied it onto is stolen or something like that, and that results in a loss of data, that initial organization will be held accountable as the custodian of that data. Uh, admin credentials. Sort of system administration accounts very often are set with a lot of access, obviously, because they're providing system administration, are set not to expire, so their passwords stay the same indefinitely, and are then quite often shared by a couple of different system administrators. The risk comes in, and let's say you now have an individual that you are kind of unhappy with, or you end up firing, we had a question earlier on actually, but how do you fire an IT sysadmin? So let's say you fire this guy, he walks off, you don't change his the admin credentials. This chap effectively has the password to log on to your environment with high privilege access. Third party access, um, it's another big sort of contributor towards claims. And it's really important to have strong processes around how you manage your third parties, making sure that you use reliable, trustworthy third parties that you can place your faith and your trust in. Because effectively you're giving them access to your environment, access to your data, and you need to make sure that they're going to treat that with the same sort of due care that you would yourself. Um, things to be wary of here are insecure external access protocols. So what mechanism are they using to connect to your environment? Is it encrypted? Is it secure? Poor authentication credential management. If internally, sysadmin accounts are often quite badly managed. For third party administrators, it's even worse because you don't necessarily know when an administrator has left, joined, gone to town, or whatever the case is. So you potentially have guys who have left the third party provider and have now got access to your environment. I mentioned the net diligence claim study earlier on, so just to sort of go into a little bit more detail around that and see which are the big sort of contributors towards claims costs. Um, <clears throat> some background information on the study itself. So claims submitted for the study range between $1,000 and $13.7 million. Hackers were the most frequent cause of loss, followed by staff mistakes, which had actually changed from the year before, where it was staff mistakes followed by hackers. So you can see the two of them are quite closely related or sort of compete for the top spot. Uh, healthcare, financial services, most frequently breach sectors, which makes sense because financial information is obviously easy to convert into money. And what often happens with healthcare information is that the individuals compromise that to be able to buy medication, etc., to their side of drug trade. So that's also quite easy to then convert into money down the road. Uh, smaller companies often experience the most incidents, which is not that surprising because they often don't have the massive security budgets and things that the large organizations do, which makes them a slightly softer target, especially against script kiddies and the like who use automated tools to try and compromise the environment. Uh, third parties account for 20% of the claims, and this is quite a scary statistic, is that insider involvement occurred in 32% of claims submitted. So one in every three claims there was an insider involvement. And it's quite difficult to have security, I mean you often set up perimeter security, but if one in three claims is an insider who's involved, it's difficult to defend against. Uh, average claim parts for the insurers, that's a nice number to see that it's come down slightly, but it's nice, to, it's interesting to see the type of numbers involved, so their sort of average claim parts are sitting at around $730,000, which is still not an insignificant amount of money. Um, this one I like because this gives you an indication of where the typical costs come involved. And when someone thinks of cyber, you often think, oh, legal reliability claims and stuff, people suing you later down the line and stuff like that. It's often not the biggest cause of the costs. Another viewpoint on that is that if you're managing your crisis properly, obviously you're incurring those costs, but you're also limiting your potential liability claims later down the line, which also limits your potential reputational damage.
Um, you can see 48% of the crisis services, and that would be the forensic investigation, the containment, the notifications, <coughs> the remediation services, etc. Uh, legal defense came in at 15% of costs, settlement at 10%. Uh, regulatory defense at 10%, the fines at 6 and then PCI fines obviously at 11%. Um, it's important to bear in mind that PCI, the payment card industry has very specific requirements around responding to an incident as far as who's, they require managing the um, investi forensic investigation into the incident and those need to be conducted by forensic investigators who PCI has pre-approved and deemed adequate to do that. So, if you just get your own forensic investigator in and it's not PCI approved or PCI do not approve of the investigation, they will force you to have another one to pick up the costs for it. Um, claims by cause of loss. So we see hackers obviously at 29%. Other things which contributed were improper data collection, lost or stolen laptop devices, malware or virus, paper records, so there are claims which are arising out of that. Uh, rogue employees, staff mistakes, system glitches, theft of hardware, theft of money, and other. Just taking a step back onto the paper records, um, it's quite important as an organization to, when you have visitors to your company, to manage how they actually have access. So having guards and receptions to screen visitors before they're granted access, and then keeping tabs on them when they're actually in that environment. Um, it's so easy to walk past the desk and pick some papers up off the desk, or pick up a phone and things like that. So it's really important to manage that aspect of visitors to your office to try and prevent <coughs> potential leakage and loss of data. Uh, sectors, and um, you can see it's pretty widespread. So we mentioned financial services got hit the hard, well financial services and healthcare got hit the hardest, but education, entertainment, gaming and casino, hospitality, media, non-profits, other, professional services, retail, technology, transportation, Breaches occurring across industries. I mean, data's got value irrespective of its source. Um, quite a topical breach which happened recently. And there's a nice one to have discussion around the Ashley Madison breach. So, estimated 37 million records were compromised. Scary thing 15,000.gov and .military email addresses. Which raises some questions. I mean, sh who would use those sorts of mail addresses to try and register onto a site like that? Is the odd um, a scary thing is that as part of the database that was compromised, it wasn't just individuals who'd actually been actively using the site. So I could, as a joke, have signed up Cuthbert to Ashley Madison. You didn't need to confirm the email address in that database that was compromised. So he would then be appearing on these lists of people who are Ashley Madison clients and be completely innocent. So that's quite a scary thing which has come from that. Um, Last count, I think there were eight class action suits which have been opened against Avid Life, who were the sort of parent company for Ashley Madison, one of which is sitting at 506, an estimated $567 million that they're claiming. Uh, in Canada there was two, and in the USA there have been one unconfirmed suicide related to the actual breach. Um, there's 1,200 Saudi Arabian email addresses. Mm. Quite scary is that adultery can be punished by death in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Uh, last week, the CEO, Noel Bitterman, stepped down. And this is also a developing trend where we're seeing executives taking a lot of the flack for how, well, for the incident and how they manage the incident. So when Ashley Madison broke, he came out, oh, we don't know that it's a legitimate breach, we don't know that the data dumps are legitimate and stuff. And the attackers then actually released a whole bunch of his emails that he sent and said, okay, deny it now. So he, he kind of talked himself into a corner. And that's why it's important with the PR side of things. To make sure that you get sound advice before you start shooting your mouth off, because you can very easily make a fool of yourself. Um, Hashcat, which is another password cracking tool. So, on the 4,000 easiest to crack passwords, the most common were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and password. So, if you're signing up to a website like that and you're using that as your password, you're probably looking for trouble. Uh, the target reach is a good one, it's almost become the case study for a retail breach. So 40 million credit and debit card numbers were stolen. Uh, Target incurred 10 million to upgrade their security. They experienced a 46% drop in profits for the fourth quarter of 2013 as opposed to 2012. So it was just after the incident itself. 
The median price per credit card stolen and resold on the black market was between $18 and $35. Um, <clears throat> the estimated cost of reissuing your cards was at $200 million, although I see Target have just reached a settlement with Visa. I think it was in the region of about $20 million, although I stand under correction. Uh, it's estimated that 1 to 3 million cards were sold on the black market. And in this instance, both the CEO and the CIO were asked to pack their bags within a year of the breach occurring. The CIO, I think, was within weeks of it occurring, and the CEO a couple of months later. So there's definitely a concern for executives as to how they're going to respond to a breach because they could very well be taking the flak, and board could be looking at pushing them out of the door to try and sort of restore investor confidence down the line. Target markets, and um, for cyber it's so broad, so organizations that store and or process sensitive data or personal information. Some feedback we've sometimes had from clients is, yes, but we don't have many clients, we don't store many <coughs> sort of client records. Oh, but you've got 3,000 employees, and what sort of information are you storing on your employees? Oh, the banking details, the medical aid details. This is still data which has got value on an underground market and is a valuable target to a potential attacker. So just because an organization doesn't necessarily store much client data doesn't mean they don't have potential exposure. Um, other things to consider is what sort of intellectual capital do you have in environments? What is the potential repercussions if that gets stolen? Um, for legal firms who often hold intellectual property and intellectual capital of their clients or sensitive information of their clients could also be an interesting target. Um, organizations who are reliant upon the, the availability of the IT systems which is most organizations now, I mean it could be logistics for a retailer, etc. Uh, provide online services, is obviously quite obvious. And conduct e-commerce operations. I mentioned earlier that data has got value irrespective of its source. Um, if you ever get the time, there's a website called informationisbeautiful.net and it gives you a bit of a rundown on some of the biggest breaches which have occurred. Uh, please feel free to, to raise your hand and, uh, and ask. Maybe before I invite questions, Tabit, you probably would want to share your experience, your habit email, and uh, the funny uh, is the slide. I had in Nigeria, and before I knew it, uh, an email was sent to one of the call center contacts, and they actually addressed it by them that uh, she must transfer 4000 from that account. And it was as if it was me who was giving that instruction uh, to my contact in the UK, the account number, and everything was there. Uh, but uh, just as well, she contacted me first because they thought to be shy. Maybe I was just trying to make sure that they are all born. So she said, uh, Are you sure? Can we do this? And I was really shocked. And then uh, you know, I realized my email you know, was there. And when I checked, and then uh, that was when I took my email over to Google Analytics and Google Analytics. Questions? Yes, David. <laughs> uh, I was just, I was doing some work for Windows 10. And the same Windows 10 had this capability of changing some features on the computer on its own. I don't know how far to reach it. But in the fact that it is true, how secure are we then if our operating systems can do that from a message of cyber and It's a good question, and <coughs> writing software the size of a Windows operating system, it's very difficult to make sure that it's 100% bug free, error free, can't be compromised. Um, I mean, for example, Facebook. They've actually got a program whereby they invite people to try and find weaknesses and stuff in Facebook and will pay them money to notify them of the breaches or of the potential vulnerabilities. So you are potentially exposed to that. Um, there are steps you can take to try and mitigate potential risks. So having things like malware, anti malware, or antivirus installed, enabling this encryption on your device and stuff. But you are potentially at risk because there are inherent vulnerabilities. 
that to patch management becomes very important because as Windows become aware of these sorts of things, they will release patches to try and address the issues. And if you're not putting in place, or you don't follow the patch management processes, you're still running an environment which is open to these sorts of things. And what becomes quite scary is that a lot of these potential weaknesses will actually be published on the internet. And you can then run automated tools against the environment to see does it have patch XYZ in place. No, it doesn't. Okay, so I can follow step one, two, and three to compromise that device. And that's why patch management is really, really important. Try and reduce the potential risk that you are exposed to. You know, their own patches. For example, now, you know, it's a requirement that all cards must be in client chip and pin. Um, I think Visa has got its own system where they say, uh, especially when you're trading online or if you are you know, buying online, you must use uh, verified by Visa, MasterCard, I think they've got uh, secure ID. But over and above that, you know, you still get, you know, issues of uh, you know, criminal activity, be it, you know, you know, card fraud, whether it's online or maybe uh, uh, cloning and things like that. Um, and I've been uh, talking to Alice in regards insurance and, you know, it seems we have not really been agreeing on how best we can do this. And also given what we have just learned today from the doctor and yourself, that as and when we try to, you know, patch up these things, there are people who are always ahead of us trying to, you know, how best can we, you know, at least contain such that you know, we, we, we keep our reputation and we are also able to uh, uh, reimburse maybe the card holders. I mean, is it, do you have something in place that can actually do this? So, where it becomes difficult from the insurance perspective. So, you can purchase the insurance policy as a bank and that will cover breach of data resulting from your environment. However, you could have a whole bunch of different merchants who are sitting in their stores all over the place and stuff like that, and they may have completely insecure practices and ways in which they are managing their data. So the accumulation risk from an insurance perspective, if you just write the bank and cover all of those merchants as well, is astronomical. And that's why often the insurance is capped to say, okay, if it's in a breach resulting from your environment, it's covered, but not from that merchant's environment. Um, we had a big incident towards the end of 2013 in South Africa where there was Dexter point of style malware which spread through a bunch of merchants. Um, there's rumours that it cost up to 100 million rand. There's no specific figures which have ever come out. In fact, one of our service providers led the investigation and they've been sworn to see because they're not allowed to tell us what it cost. And a lot of the things which came out from that is that the merchants were using the machine which they had connected the POS device to they were also browsing the internet on, they weren't worrying about antivirus and patch management and things like that. So it's difficult to ensure that environment. We are investigating and putting together a product for some of the South African banks to roll out to their merchants, so almost like a merchant program, which would provide the merchant with the PCI expenses related to the card replacement costs, um, the forensic investigation, etc. But it is, from an insurer perspective, very difficult to offer one policy which will cover the bank as well as all the emergent environments as well. Uh, my customers, uh, maybe for me, what is critical is my card holders, because those are the people that hold accounts with us. And also to try and uh, 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 maintain credibility, you know, is there something maybe that we can maybe craft in terms of the card holders, just card holders? There's a common question that I've had from the clients who were moving out. Uh, to do with the issue of card cloning, to say at what point, uh, at, do you know at what point a card is cloned and does insurance cover that, uh, that aspect? So I think maybe if you can just marry that with, with what type of time. Potentially open a liability claim against you later on for the last month and stuff, but that's not necessarily the route you want to go because you've now suffered a reputational damage, they've had to institute uh, legal proceedings, etc. Um, it, it's a good question, one I'll probably have to kind of ponder on a bit and see if we can put something together and we might have to go and touch back with our reinsurers and say, okay, is there a way that you can make that slightly more proactive? Um, there is an argument that the cloning of the card is that a privacy breach through malicious activities of employees, etc. So it's one I'm going to do. Thank you.
side of cyber security. Uh, we have heard uh, much about the other side um, of security when it comes to the cyber space, but uh, this afternoon uh, we're going to look at the legal side. Uh, the outline, I'll start with the introduction, uh, uh, cyber risk, the growing threat, current legal framework, under that, I'll look at the Criminal Court, uh, the post Telecommunications Act, the Intersection of Communications Act, uh, Common Law, the Cyber Crime Bill. I'll do an analysis of that and uh, draw some conclusions. Uh, why the, the legal side of uh, cyber security? I think, um, as already mentioned by the previous presenters, There is need uh, for, for the cyber space to be secure. And this is now a global concern. Uh, the UN passed a number of resolutions on cyber security, on the need by member states to come up with uh, laws which address cyber security. And uh, the ITU, following uh, the UN resolutions, ITU is International Telecommunications uh, Union. It's a specialized agency of the United Nations responsible for the telecommunications sector under the UN. It came up with the, a national cyber security strategy. In their, in their strategy, they stated that cyber security is no longer concerned with the, the security of computers, but it is now a national concern because it impacts on the economy, uh, the national. Uh, uh, critical infrastructure, the health and other se sectors. So, um, the ITU we came up with the motor laws on cyber security, uh, which they encourage member states to adopt. And uh, in our SADAC region, the SADAC adopted uh, those uh, motor laws um, on cyber security sometime in 2012. Zimbabwe, uh, then with the assistance of ITU, came up with the, the draft views on the computer crime and cyber crime law, data protection uh, law and uh, electronic transactions um, act sometime in 2013. So we, we already have those views in place. I'm going to talk more about the cyber crime uh, later. I think I also need to mention that um, the, the current uh, existing laws are a bit outdated. Uh, they were enacted sometime in 2004 and um, government is in the process of introducing a revised ICT policy which also addresses cyber security concerns. Um, Although cybercrime is a commonly used term today, there's no standard global definition. Um, the definition varies based on the context. But a widely accepted definition of cybercrime refers to any illegal activities using or against computer systems, computer networks, and the internet. So uh, that, that's the accepted definition of cybercrime. And uh, someone asked uh, whether these uh, criminal activities are happening outside Zimbabwe. Is it happening uh, in America and other countries only uh, and not here in Zimbabwe? Uh, this is just to show that um, there are reports, especially in the media, that um, Zimbabwe is actually experiencing uh, cyber crime activities. So this report. Um, uh, came out sometime in April 2012. Uh, there was a story on how um, people were duped when they were trying to buy cars online in Japan and uh, other countries. You know, people can easily buy cars online these days. So some, someone looked uh, into a fake uh, website trying to buy a car and unfortunately uh, it transferred the money to that company which was not in existence, only to realize uh, after the promised period that uh, this was a, a fake company. No delivery took place at the end of the day.
cybercrime is borderless uh, in nature because of the absence of uh, physical barriers. So the actions of, of uh, these perpetrators affect uh, potential victims of cyber criminals uh, in any part of the world. It can be in Zimbabwe. A perpetrator can be based in South Africa. Like uh, Dr. Lukana talked about his friends in Nigeria who oh, have information about... Uh, sorry, <laughs> but, but they are your, your friends, yes. <laughs> 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 because I think it's a huge <laughs>
has also resulted in a rise in the number of people now able to access internet services. Uh, the mobile population uh, rose from 58.4% in 2010 to 91.5% in 2015. You can see that uh, now a lot of people are connected. And uh, internet penetration rate also escalated from 4.8% in 2010. You can imagine in 2010 only few people were enjoying internet services. It was only 4.8% out of uh, uh, the, the whole population of Zimbabwe. But now it stands at uh, 45%. And this in itself shows the need for our cyberspace to be secured because now a lot of people are accessing um, internet services. So this uh, graph simply shows the, the internet penetration rate from 2010 to 2015. So uh, the increased use of technology um, results in increased uh, uh, risk of cyber crime attacks. I think uh, the, the breaches were explained to us by the previous presenters. Uh, we already know uh, what uh, these cyber attacks are capable of, of doing when it comes to business transactions. You know, the, the, the problem of business disruptions, online scams, theft from business, theft of data, identity theft, and so on. Uh, this was explained uh, in detail by the, the previous presenters. Now we look at the legal framework um, in Zimbabwe. Cyber criminal law in Zimbabwe is provided uh, mainly in Chapter 8 of the Criminal Law Quantification and Reform Act, Chapter uh, 9.23. Now I was talking to colleagues outside during my time, and uh, a lot of people were not aware of the existence of this law. It's not just people in here, but a lot of people in Zimbabwe are not aware that we do have um, a law in place which actually uh, provides for cyber criminal law. This whole chapter from section 162 to section 168 provides for computer related crimes, often collectively described as cyber crime, in line with the recommendation of the Law Development Commission of Zimbabwe, made in its report number 75 of 1999. So, as you can see, it's a very old law. Uh, the, the recommendations to come up with the, that specific chapter on computer related to crimes was actually made sometime in, in 1999 and since then a lot of changes uh, have uh, evolved in the cyberspace. That report demonstrated the potential for fraud, sabotage and other harm that may be caused to the public interest by the deliberate misuse of computer or computer networks, credits and debit cards, passwords and PIN numbers. So you can see that it, it actually covers a, a variety of uh, issues uh, which, which um, take place in the cyberspace. Other statutes providing for cybercrime related offenses are the Interception of Communications Act, Chapter 11.20, and the Post and Telecommunications Act. I just picked on these two because I felt they may be relevant to, to, this, to this particular audience. But we also have other statutes which have uh, provisions which can be interpreted to apply to cyber crime. Now I'll move on to analysis of the court. The court provides for substantive penal laws on cyber crime, excluding procedural law aspects attended there too, and matters to do with cooperation with other jurisdictions in the fight against the cyber security threats. So the, the court um, in, in that chapter, which I referred to, chapter 8, provides mainly for substantive law provisions. Uh, we do have the mutual assistance in criminal matters act, 
which was enacted sometime in the 70s. But that act is no longer relevant because uh, it covered the traditional offenses, excluding uh, the modern day uh, crime. So it, it's mainly to be revisited to also cater for, for cyber crime. The short title of chapter 8 of the court is Computer Related Crime. This title covers offenses where the computer is used as an object to commit the offense, but does not include cases where the com computer is the subject of the offense, such as illegal devices and illegal interference. So the title in itself is limited uh, in a way in that it only covers um, offenses where the computer is used as an object, but not those offenses where uh, the, the computer is the subject um, of the crime. Section 162 of the, of the court provides for definitions. I have just picked a few definitions just to illustrate uh, the limitations in this law. The definition of a, of a computer, for example, is very restrictive. Uh, the court also limits the definition of a device to monetary transactions only. I, I've included a, a copy of uh, the criminal court. Uh, I think you will find it uh, in the documents which you are going to receive after this workshop, so that you go through it and uh, uh, maybe see for yourself uh, what it exactly provides. Then the definition of data excludes a program suitable to cause a computer system to perform a function. Those are some of the limitations. Then section 163 to section 165 of the court provides for unauthorized access, deliberate introduction of virus, and unauthorized manipulation of computer data. I think that diagram above is showing someone uh, who is trying to access uh, the computer using his own key uh, and is, is definitely not authorized to do so. The court creates the crimes of unauthorized access to, a, to or use of a computer, deliberate introduction of a computer virus into a computer or computer network and unauthorized manipulation of a proposed computer program. All these offending activities are undesirable varieties of what is commonly known as computer hacking. I think uh, the previous presenters talked a lot about uh, hacking. And uh, just to show you that this uh, offense is adequately provided for uh, in our own uh, criminal court, just in case you maybe you were not aware that uh, there is actually a uh, recourse. If someone uh, heads into your computer, you can actually report them to the police uh, and uh, the police can investigate the matter and uh, prosecute the, the offender. So over and above uh, the compensation from the insurers, uh, we also want these perpetrators to be locked behind bars because we don't want them to get away with murder. Uh, we want them to, to pay for their sins at the end of the day. So that's the reason why we need a strong uh, legal uh, system in place. So um, I just copied uh, section 163 um, and pasted it there for you to get a clear understanding of uh, what it provides. It actually provides for unauthorized access to or use of computer or computer network. Any person who without authority from the owner of the computer or computer network intentionally gains access to or destroys or alters or renders meaningless, useless or ineffective or copies or transfers or obstructs, intercepts, diverts, interrupts or interferes with the use of any data program or system which is held in a computer or computer network shall be guilty of unauthorized access to or use of a computer or computer network and liable if the crime was committed in any of the aggravating circumstances described in section 166 to a fine not exceeding level 12, 12 or imprisonment uh, for a pre period not exceeding 10 years or both. So you can see um, the 
the, the sentence there, uh, or the penalty, uh, 10 years, uh, to me, it's, uh, it's a very good uh, penalty. Because if someone is to be locus away for 10 years, I, I think he, the, the offender will, will teach others that he, uh, <laughs> this hacking business uh, is not good after all. So we, we do have uh, this provision in our penal code just in case we are not away, which we can uh, also resort to offer about uh, uh, getting compensation from our insurers. Uh, now, uh, let's look at the aggravating circumstances in relation to crimes under section 163, 164, and 165. I again copied uh, section 166 and pasted it uh, there for you to, to appreciate uh, what it uh, provides for. It says that the crime of unauthorized access to or use of a computer, deliberate introduction of a computer virus into a computer or computer network, or an authorized manipulation of, of a proposed computer program is committed in aggravating circumstances if committed in connection with or in furtherance of commission or attempted commission of the crime of insurgence, banditry, sabotage or terrorism, theft, unauthorized borrowing or use of property, extortion, fraud, forgery, malicious damage to property, damaging, destroying or prejudicing the self-operation of a, an aircraft, concealing, disguising or enjoying the process of the unlawful dealing in dangerous drugs, corruptly using a false document or defeating or obstructing the course of justice or the computer or computer network uh, data program or system is owned by the state, a law enforcement agency, the defense forces, the prison service, a state of cooperation, a local or like authority. <coughs> or the crime of occasions considering material prejudice to the one of the computer, computer network data program or system, or the crime disrupts or interferes with an essential service. So as you can see, uh, almost all the traditional offenses are covered here. So if those traditional offenses are commit committed using a computer network uh, or a computer system, then the person can be prosecuted in terms of this section uh, of the criminal code. Then section 167 of the court provides for unauthorized use of credit and debit cards. I think there was a, a lengthy debate on the use of uh, credit cards. We, we do have a, a provision in our court uh, which covers that. It actually uh, creates a specific crime uh, penalizing the forgery or unauthorized use of credit or debit cards. So if anyone is caught doing that, uh, they should be prosecuted in terms of that uh, particular section. Then we have section 168 of the court, which provides for unauthorized use of passwords and PIN numbers. It creates a specific crime penalizing the unauthorized use of a password or a PIN number. So if anyone steals uh, a PIN number from you or a password from you, and you know that uh, the, the PIN number has been stolen, you can report that person to the police and they, they can be prosecuted in terms of that uh, section. It is actually meant uh, to uh, cover uh, offenses related to identity theft, but unfortunately it is a bit limited in the way it was crafted. So the, the new bill has expanded uh, this offense to now cover um, other aspects of identity theft. Uh, now we will look at uh, the Interception of Communications Act. Allow me to take some water. Uh, the, the previous presenters have been hammering on the importance of security of personal data uh, or uh, any data uh, which is owned by 
by individuals, companies, and so on. Now, in terms of our constitution, section 57D of the constitution provides that every person has a right to privacy, which includes the right not to have the privacy of their communications infringed. So this is a constitutional right which is provided for in our constitution. So if anyone infringes your communication right in any way, either by an unauthorized access of your communication or intercepting your communication, then the person can be uh, prosecuted um, in terms of that provision. Over and above that, uh, illegal interception of communications is also provided for in the Interception of Communications Act, uh, which provides for lawful interception and monitoring of certain communications in the course of their transmission in Zimbabwe. It criminalizes the unlawful interception of private communication by means of telecommunication system or radio communication system. So it is an offense here in Zimbabwe to intercept communication between uh, bankers, for example. If a bank is communicating with other business, maybe trying to give them their uh, top 20 <laughs> depositors, then you intercept that communication. You will be committing an offense which can be prosecuted in terms of that uh, statute. Uh, but maybe the only limitation which I highlighted is that um, it, it needs to, to be broadened so that it becomes technology neutral, so that the communication is not restricted to telecommunication or radio communication only, but it can be any communication through an electronic <coughs> system. So that again has been addressed in the new bill. Now we move on to the Post and Telecommunications Act, Chapter 12.05, uh, which we administer as portraits. Um, this one is very important uh, when it comes to uh, issues to do with the harassment using telephone or telecommunication uh, systems. I think that uh, image there is just showing someone in a non caller uh, telling someone that I'm going to hate you or I'm going to take all your money from the bank or give me this, or I will take your child, something like that. Any abusive communication which can be done through the, the phones is actually uh, regulated in terms of Section 88 of the Post and Telecommunications Act, which provides for offensive or false telephone messages. I think it is a very popular uh, section uh, with the police because they get a lot of reports uh, to do with the, uh, that, uh, that provision where, especially with the politicians, they, they, they sometimes threaten each other using the phones or, <laughs> or the big houses and small houses. <laughs> <laughs> so my name can quickly rush to the police and report uh, that uh, someone has offended them uh, through the phone. So it actually provides that any person who sends by telephone any message that is grossly offensive or is in an indecent, obscene or threatening character or sends by telephone any message that he knows to be false for the purpose of causing annoyance, inconvenience, or needless anxiety to any other person, or makes any telephone call or series of, or combination of telephone call offense and life with a fine not exceeding level of such fine and such imprisonment. So uh, this uh, section actually criminalizes harassment of persons through telephone messages or calls or abuse of telephone services. So it might be of interest to you as bankers, insurers, that if anyone threatens you in any manner using a telephone, then you know that you have a recourse in terms of that uh, section. Uh, but again, it needs to be broadened so that it covers all electronic communications, such as the internet. Uh, these days you can receive 
email messages from unknown senders, um, maybe threatening you or, or saying offensive um, uh, things. So again, this has been addressed in the new view, uh, the limitations of this particular section. Uh, now we we'll look at uh, our common law. I will try to, to address uh, the question why uh, why we do not have uh, statistics or a lot of uh, reported cases in this uh, area of uh, cybercrime. I, I do not yet the answer, uh, but I will just give you my opinion <laughs> on the matter. Um, surprisingly, uh, the the Chapter which I, I have just presented to you in the Criminal Court, Chapter 8 of the Criminal Court, um, came into effect in 2004. But since then, uh, there are no reported cases which were prosecuted in terms of that particular law. It's very surprising. But before the court uh, came into existence, there were cases uh, which were decided by, by the courts. Uh, the reason might be that people are not aware of the existence of this uh, law uh, in our criminal court or maybe it's to do with the confidence and trust issues. Uh, for example, if a bank is held, I, I think uh, the, the banker will have to wait uh, whether to make it a public, uh, public information or to deal with the, the laws uh, quietly. Because if I know that my bank has been hacked, the next thing is to immediately withdraw my, my cash because uh, I will not be feeling secure uh, anymore with that system. So it could be the reason why these cases are not being reported. But like I said, I don't have the, the, the answers. Uh, I'm just giving you my opinion. But uh, before 2004, in 1998, uh, this is a reported uh, case which uh, came before the High Court. It's a case of State versus Chirunga. The accused was charged with the housebreaking with intent to steal and theft, but convicted by the Magistrate Court of Theft only. The facts of the matter were that the accused was a former employee of a building society. He conspired with a cleaner at the society's premises to let him leave the premises after hours at a time when he had no authority to be there. While they used the society's computer to make fictitious deposits into the accounts of two other persons, these persons thereafter withdrew money from their accounts. The magistrate acquitted the accused of housebreaking on the grounds that he had been allowed into the premises by the cleaner who was lawfully inside. So no housebreaking <laughs> took place according to the magistrate. On review, the High Court held that the accused should have been convicted of housebreaking also. It was further held that the crime the accused intended to commit was fraud rather than theft. And he should have been charged with housebreaking with intent to commit fraud. Now that, that that's the ruling of the High Court. However, they had been theft by false pretenses committed when the two account holders would the the money. The court, however, noted that it was not necessary to order the verdict, as theft by false pretenses was a species of theft. In his reasons for judgment, the judge noted that in perpetrating the offense of theft by false pretenses, the accused gained illegal access to a computer. You see now where the issues of uh, unauthorized access were uh, uh, came to form, and fraudulently altered the computer records. And back then, uh, the offense of unauthorized access, access to a computer um, or a computer system was not yet an offense in terms of our, our statutes. But the magistrate uh, took note of that um, and convicted the person. Then uh, the, the other question uh, which was raised uh, in this seminar was uh, whether it's possible to put a value to, to your data uh, or to your records. There is a case uh, which came for consideration before the High Court again. 
in the case of S versus Mutemi in 1998. In this case, the Zimbabwe court applied an exception to the general Roman Dutch principle that incorporal things could not be stolen. Before this case, uh, it was not possible to report a case of, uh, of um, uh, theft of incorporals, those things which are intangible. Because according to the Roman Dutch principles, it was not possible for anyone to, to steal an intangible thing. Only tangible things could be stolen. So the accused broke into the complainant's car and, and stole a number of documents. The complainant placed a high value on two of the files included in the documents. The accused was convicted based on the intrinsic value of the goods stolen. So the court uh, considered the high value which was placed by which was placed on the documents uh, by the accused person. The court held that the general principle of Roman Dutch law that intangible things could not be stolen had been challenged in modern times. It is quite clear that there are exceptions to that general statement of the law. It was held further that courts in Zimbabwe and elsewhere have dealt with several cases of computer frauds involving, in some cases, theft of substantial amounts of money made possible by false credit and debit entries. So, in, in, in this case, again, um, the courts were proactive in that they addressed uh, these um, issues, taking into account the realities of the modern life. Uh, they did not just uh, confine themselves to the principles of the law which existed then, but they, they took into account the, the realities on the ground. And this, this is a good precedence which can be used uh, even today when, the, when data is stolen from, the, from your computer or from your device. You can all, always refer to this particular case as precedence to when it comes to sorry. Okay, I was saying this is a good precedence on placing value on data uh, records or any other personal information which can be stolen from our computer systems. Now I will move on to the Computer Crime and Cyber Crime Bill. Uh, this is still um, a bill uh, which is uh, now with, the, with our cabinet. It's, it's now being considered at cabinet level. So I think it's, it's making very good progress. Uh, we are hoping that very soon uh, it will be enacted into law. Like I mentioned earlier on, it is not the only view which is under consideration. There is also the electronic uh, transactions view and the data protection view. But I'm going to dwell on the cyber crime view uh, for purposes of, uh, of this seminar. The, the view, as mentioned earlier on, was uh, uh, crafted along the provisions of the ICT, uh, Drafts, Police, and the SADC Computer Crime and Cyber Crime Model Law, which I mentioned that uh, uh, SADC was assisted by ITU to come up with those model laws. The main objectives of the bill are to provide a legal framework for the criminalization of computer and network related offenses, to criminalize certain legal content in line with the regional and international best practices, provide the necessary specific procedural instruments for the investigation of such offenses and define the liability of service providers. Um, the bill is structured into six parts. It has the preliminary uh, measures uh, provision at the So on the first part, then the specific offenses, jurisdiction, admissibility of evidence, procedure and liability of service providers. The bill uh, avoids over legislating and facilitates both the technological advancements and new and innovative developments in cybercrime. 
Well, now we'll look at uh, part one. You, you are going to get copies of this uh, draft bill uh, for your consideration when you go back to your offices. And if you have any comments on the bill, feel free to forward them. Uh, we'll make sure that they reach uh, the relevant offices. Or you can communicate directly uh, with the Ministry of ICT. A, a number of consultations were held on the bills uh, at national level. But just in case you missed the process and you feel you have uh, some contributions to make, uh, feel free to, to make those contributions. Uh, part one provides for definitions and uh, says the objective of the act, scope application and the date when the act will come into force like any other piece of legislation. Then it defines terms such as computer system, access provider, and uh, it is using sufficiently broad writing and where possible illustrative examples. Then, uh, for example, in section 3.1, the term access provider is defined as both a legal person as well as a natural person. So if the perpetrator uh, or the operator of a private network, it can either be, sorry, if even the operator of a private network can therefore be considered as an access provider because this is a legal person. If you are an operator of a, a, a private network, you, you are also an access provider. Then the bill goes on to define critical infrastructure uh, as computer systems, devices, network, computer programs, computer data, so vital to the country that the incapacity or destruction of or interference with such systems and assets would have uh, a deliberating impact on security, national or economic security, national public health, and service, or any combination of those matters. So you can see that your sectors are also covered here. Uh, when we make reference to economic security, we cannot have economic security without the banks, uh, without uh, our businesses, as an example. So um, that uh, infrastructure of the banks is so key or important um, that it needs to be secured uh, at national level. Part 2 provides for substantive criminal law provisions or offenses. The purpose of for this part uh, is to improve means to prevent and address computer and network related crime by defining a common minimum standard of relevant offenses based on best practice prevailing within the region as well as international standards. All offenses established in this uh, bill require that offender um, should carry out uh, the offense intentionally. Reckless acts are therefore not covered. So you notice that uh, it always makes reference to intentional. If someone intentionally uh, gains access to a computer system, you have to do it uh, knowing fully well that uh, what I'm doing, uh, I'm gaining access to this uh, sorry, doctor, uh, the computer system. If I think what I'm doing maybe uh, is something different, then I cannot be prosecuted for that off offense because it was not intentional. But if it's an intentional <laughs> act, <laughs> I, I was just trying to, to look for an example. <laughs> what is what it is that can be done intentionally? Maybe I was trying to get this in the laptop. I was not trying to. <laughs>
Offenses in this category are directed against at least one of the three legal principles of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So, uh, the most common offenses in this category include um, espionage, illegal data acquisition, illegal interception, data interference, system interference, illegal access or hacking, cracking, breaking of password, uh, protected sites, circumventing password protection on computer system, usually used to commit further crimes, e.g. data exploitation, data manipulation, or denial of service. So all these offenses are against uh, those uh, principles of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. <coughs> Factors supporting increasing attacks include inadequate, incomplete protection of computer systems, development of software tools that automate attacks. I think this was addressed by the previous two presenters. The need for, for protection of computer systems. So up and above that, we are saying we also need um, a very good uh, legal framework which enables uh, these uh, perpetrators uh, to be prosecuted so that uh, they deter other uh, would-minded uh, offenders. Then the content related offenses. Um, content considered illegal including child pornography, racism and hate speech, uh, spam, violation of intellectual property rights, and so on. So the bill addresses uh, content-related offenses. Any content uh, which can be considered to be unlawful uh, can be the, the offender or the perpetrator will be prosecuted in terms of, uh, of that act when it comes into existence. Then we also have the computer-related offenses. This category covers a number of offenses that need a computer system to be committed. This includes uh, computer-related fraud. It's already covered in the court um, as shown um, earlier on. We also have computer-related forgery, where the traditional offense of forgery is committed using a computer system or a computer network. Then we have illegal access, we have identity theft, we have harassment utilizing means of electronic communications. So all these um, computer-related offenses can be prosecuted in terms of this uh, uh, upcoming law. Again, the view uh, provides for a combination of offenses. Uh, in the sheet, we've got regulators from the insurance industry, from the banking sector, and from the, telecom from the telecommunication sector. We do have insurance companies and masters, we've got brokers, and I think it was quite a diverse group of, um, of audience, and it was very lively, and again, I think uh, it's, it's something that we should recommend ourselves and clear them for ourselves, but I didn't see anyone sleeping, and I think that's something that we should clear them for. <laughs> okay, so after the experts have spoken, it's very difficult to give a recap of what the experts have been saying because when I want to say refilling, I may end up saying refilling, and it's very, you know, it's uh, it's quite it's been quite technical from an IT perspective, from a legal perspective, and from an insurance perspective. But we want to thank our speakers, Dr. Rukanda uh, from Monipan. Um, he, he did a stellar job uh, to scare us. So, <laughs> On the list that we are that we are living with, but thank goodness we had Ryan Badakubi, who also gave us the solution that is not all about the risk that is present. Yes, the risk is there, but we need to manage the risk. And uh, Ryan managed to, to give us some hope. And uh, given that there is a group coming in, I think we the future is very much brighter. So maybe just to as a recap um, to where we started from. Uh, when our MD came in, he spoke of um, a simple thing. On, um, he was he was looking in Google, on Google on how to pay, and there were many many solutions. 
the psychic uh, the one thing that the plus or minus 80 people that are here can take home with them that we are moving out with the plus or minus 80 acres from this room. <laughs> <laughs> because anyone is a possible suspect and I, I probably look at myself at my age I, I, I'm not that old, but I can tell you that my child is much smarter than me when it comes to computers and, and all that. And who knows what they can conceal, and who knows what they can do with the computer that we can't do. I know universities, some have been, you know, students that head into the, into the results system to ensure that they've got the right results. Um, you know, it's all part of the... The, the process that we are, we are trying to deal with, the risks that we've never thought of. And as insurance companies, we are looking at it. Let's look at it from a perspective that, oh, the fire risk might be that limited for this particular client, but the cyber risk that is involved can actually be huge. So as companies, we've probably been just focusing on the other side, which is probably your property. Uh, you've probably been uh, concentrating on your fidelity guarantee that your, 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 your staff can only steal money from you, like physically, but you know they can do it through, they don't need to be there, they just need to use a computer. Um, you know, even the, the, the robot, we see bank robots, they have kind of declined, but they are still there, those people without money, with that mindset to steal from the bank. And they are looking at new ways of doing things, and they are much ahead of us. Like Dr. Bukanda said, that they are always a step ahead. Now that you put all the security systems, they don't even have to come to Zimbabwe, for instance, to steal the US dollar. They just have to sit on a computer and they can do what they can do best. So, uh, thank you very much to our presenters. We will on about the issue of big data, it's something that we just used to hear big data, big data. But um, today, I think we learned what, uh, what, what the big data is. And maybe an example that we got is just like in our bodies. Uh, the, it's, it's, it's a complicated computer, and at the end of the day, all is sitting within the brain. And so if you take it that way, that uh, there are a lot of interconnectivity in the activities that we do. And you don't know which part of the connectivity is actually giving room to a hacker or which particular interconnectivity is actually giving out private information, you know, you need to be secure in as much as you can try to, to, to foolproof the room. And I think from an insurance perspective, I talk in as much as you can put sprinkler systems, you can put fire alarms, if that it doesn't stop a fire from occurring. So the, 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 the risks are there. We can put in measures to, with the risk management measures to protect ourselves, but again, you remember, there's always a backup plan for that, that, that which you may not have easily foreseen that it can happen to you. You never know when it happens, and you never know that it can actually happen to you. Um, quite interestingly, um, Ryan also spoke about how susceptible we are to our own employees. I don't know how many times we've thought about it, and um, with these three months notice issues that were coming up, you know, you don't know what the guy next is sitting, you know, in, in your office is thinking about. And it's something that gives us really serious uh, worries when you're looking at cyber insurance. I think someone asked the question, well, how do you fire an IT person? Because these are the areas where that concern um, uh, cyber insurance. Um, I also noted, you know, some of the very uh, simple things that we don't observe risk management issues, how many people have used the word password in a password? <laughs> I think we've got quite a number of people who have done that. And all our organizations and our IT guys think the organization is pretty secure, but there are a lot of guys who are using password as a password. I mean, how many times have you have obtained a line from, from, your, te from your telecommunications network and you have given a default password 0, 0, 0, 0. <laughs> you know, today that's still your, your phone password, 0, 0, 0, 0. <laughs> you know, so I mean, even, you know, it doesn't need a complicated data to think that how to get into your phone. It's simply doing the, you know, you know, just common sense as it, as it were. And a 
then another interesting thing that also came up today is just because we do not speak about um, cyber insurance, uh, cyber risks that, we, that affect us on a day-to-day -day basis. In my experience, what I've actually noticed is as we went around trying to introduce this topic to many companies, you find people that that cannot, you know, comprehend that these things can actually happen in Zimbabwe. Until someone that you know actually gives an example that, yes, it actually happened to me. Yes, it can actually happen to me. So maybe until such a time that um, something is actually happened to you, you may not think it's a risk that is but these are actually risks that are around us and these are risks that exist. I mean, it's like asking maybe in this room to say, let's have a statistic. How many men have cheated on their wives? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very difficult statistic to, to always have. On a way still, how many, how many men have been cheated by their wives? I think if we could find volunteers for the first answer, definitely for the second answer, because you don't want to be exposed. So, we, this is the issue about cyber liability, cyber risk. So I can then ask the same question, let's, let's take it out from the merit setup. How many banks have ever been hacked? How many telecom uh, websites have ever been defaced? How many people have actually built, um, responded to the wrong email and sent the critical information to the wrong person? How many people have actually found themselves erroneously divulging private information of a client to a competitor or to another person? And maybe from the public sector, how many people have erroneously made blunders that found that ensure somebody's uh, with private, with private information in the WH ratio. So you see, these things, they happen in a day, one or day to day basis, but because we've never conceptualized it from a fact that it's a risk that we are living with. And fortunately, from an insurance perspective, we've tried to come up with the products that we are saying it can actually uh, cover some of these risks that we are, that we are facing. So for today, who are our target clients? I think we've heard it from the horse's mouth. Everybody is a target client. If you're an insurance company and you're trying to sell cyber insurance to somebody else, think about yourself. How many times do you pay claims? And how many times do you get you know, bank details via email and you send the, you know, and then you just send the, you know, the bank transfer according to the instructions that you got from email. Have you ever thought that that email would actually have been met and you sent the, the payment to the wrong person. So these are some of the issues that we need to look at if you are in, in the hospitality industry and you have been hosting one of the major, you know, one of the major musicians at your hotel for quite some time and then all of a sudden you find out somebody has information that so and so has been coming to your hotel every morning. How did that information get into the public domain? You can end up being sued for that. And then there is the cyber liability issue aspect that come in to help you defend yourself as well as to help you um, keep the, 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 the litigation course. We've also wondered, okay, so what if somebody gets my data? I think Ryan did a good job in, in telling us the cost of some of the data that, you know, it doesn't have to cost that much. It doesn't have to look pricey to you. Just that number, that, that, you know, your credit card number, it can be sold somewhere for a, for a price. I recently had, um, I, I visited the, the Registrar General's uh, office recently. I think they, they, right now they're quite, you know, quite organized and they were, there was even um, education that was being provided whilst you are in the queue. I couldn't even notice the one hour you gone whilst I'm in the queue. And one of the things that the, the guy who was talking to us kept insisting about was the issue of and I'm like, what's so important about taking care of my identity? 
Until then, one time he says, you know, these things, they can be used, you know, there are some people who want to collect dead bodies from the mortuaries and they don't even have, uh, you know, they don't even have an ID. So they go to the market where they, they can go and find these things. You just go and buy the ID, you go and present, no one is going to complain the face of a, of a corpse and the face of a corpse. <laughs> value of that ID when you bought it. But to someone who is trying to get it, they know how much valuable that thing is to you. So you may not protect your ID thinking, okay, if it gets lost, I'm going to get another one. But what will have happened is maybe the registrar general is because they're already dead. Okay, so I think uh, maybe as, a, as, a, as an issue to round up, I think this is Krua also headed on the talk about the issues of the of the bills that are coming up. And given the technological advancements that uh, that the you know the world has been going through, I think it's quite necessary and you know, quite frankly, yes, you were surprised that no one has ever claimed on the, you know, has ever reported to the police on that on, on that um, the, the cyber criminal law which already exists. But in all ends, I think for me it's my first time to actually hear about the existence of that law. So, you know, it's the issue of awareness. Like I said, the moment you want to use something, the moment you are not dealing with cyberness, that's the moment that you know the existence of some of these things. So let's not look at it from a perspective that these things don't happen, or just because we do not have Zimbabwe examples of these things that have been happening. In fact, we do, but it's because there are issues that happen behind closed doors, issues that we cannot disclose. It has, it has actually been happening on a massive scale, and there is need for us to ensure that, apart from us as FPC reinsurance trying to sell insurance, I think another take home is the issue to improve our risk management as organization. We need to do is it penetration testing, doctor? Uh, now and again, into our own system, we do audits every now and again, internal audits, but no one ever tells how secure our systems are on a, on a, you know, on a regular basis. And I think um, I'm glad what KEMG has audited us here. I should say how often, how secure, you know, this, uh, you know, your clients are in terms of, um, you know, how, how easy it is to penetrate on them. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very good risk management lesson that we have had today, apart from the issues of uh, of looking at, um, at, the, at the existence of an insurance solution. I think for, from an insurance perspective, what we've also now tried to do is just to bridge the gap between the traditional covers and um, the, 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 the cyber insurance. Uh, that is not coming into it. So you find that, uh, like Ryan put it, you have your professional indemnity policy, but it does not cover certain aspects that are covered by the side insurance project. So I think for, for many banks, you've got your triple B policy, it's got a list of things that are covered, that is your fidelity guarantee, your professional indemnity, your money policy, but you don't have the side aspect of it, and this is where you just need to come in and get that extra little thing that probably gives you the protection that you may thank God you had when the when the, when the event that is when the event eventually happens. I think from my perspective, in, 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 this is what I probably took home as a as the summary of uh, today's meeting. I know. Probably we still have some people that may have questions from either Ryan's presentation or from Dr. Rukanda's presentation. I don't know, do we still have any who would want to ask questions before we close the floor to Ryan or Dr. Rukanda? I think Mr. Uh, Kurua in the same share of questions <laughs> with <laughs> But probably in the morning we're still not fired up, so do we still have that? some people like amongst us who think they might want to ask a few questions? In view of uh, the sensitivity of uh, information, uh, <clears throat> the position of uh, the banking financial services is efficient. What would be your recommendation, or what would be your view uh, taking into consideration your experience?
experience in the open missions and other abuse missions with respect to financial services institution, either setting up a cloud or setting up a integrated data center. I basically think, uh, uh, Mr. Mayer, I basically think that the two are inseparable. I think, uh, I also think that as the Reserve Bank, you still supervise banks that do not have uh, or are not yet on cloud or are uh, not yet moving towards that. I think it's a big risk. I think the only way you can monitor the level of secure or how secure a financial institute is is when they move onto that platform. Because there are so many stories. I mean, you have got this packet of network structures, K5, some K6, some fiber, and some are still on the jelly filled cables, you know. It, all, all, the, all the topologies, the network layers are not even secure at all. So for me, uh, uh, first point of call, because of the cost associated is to just make it compulsory for the financial institution to get the data center. That is within the definitions of the requirements of it. And secondly, obviously, the level of confidence goes on to, uh, depending on the firma, it goes on to uh, cloud. You can't do it without cloud. Uh, yeah, you are doing it. I know the banks are doing it here. But I think for the safety of the nature of data and information that, that uh, individuals and corporates have sitting in the land institutions with Zimbabwe billion US dollars, you will need that structure. So class A, as I said, class B cloud. Even if a organization says we are keeping our data bank in cloud and we are safe, but what happens if something goes into that cloud and somebody exit, they don't have the fall in position even if they can claim for each other. So we still need it to so that we can uh, and, 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 and you may find that uh, if the, the particular data center that we have with the way they set up the animals, they are also should on a cloud platform. I just want to, I want to explain this so simple because people have been complaining that I have to do it today. <laughs> so I want to make sure I leave it in English level. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you so much. <laughs> I also wanted to direct my question to the doctor. Uh, when he was doing his presentation, he talked about data analytics. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, the kind of data that they use uh, or that he proposes can be used uh, uh, for to do analytics for cyber, uh, cyber risk. And I also wanted to understand uh, the kind of results uh, that can be drawn from that data and uh, also obviously how uh, the results uh, from that uh, analysis can be used to manage the uh, cyber risk. The analysis of the data. Thank you very much for the question. I think the, the first thing that uh, you need to know uh, about the big data is that we are talking huge volumes and quantities of data uh, and, and their area of storage and uh, the speed of accessing them, their integrity in terms of uh, security and the level of authenticity. Uh, it's, it's not a cyber uh, security uh, attribute or characteristic. But because we now have big data, because the internet pulls all the data together, we now have in some way a way we are keeping assuming it's sitting in the cloud. Within the cloud, we can extract particular information for if we want to, for example, extract the demographics of Zimbabwe, or we want to extract things that have been closed up in Zimbabwe in the reasons. We just have to access our data bank where the data is sitting in the tool that and there are various tools that you can use. You can use IBM guys, you use Hadoops, a very dynamic tool you will see in the presentation. When I did big data there, it's almost 50 slides. I just cut it at about 50, all explained in the processes. Infosys has got a very good tool. So even I think the SAP now has got a tool for 
the way you want to define your report or the data that you want to bring out and see the report. So, uh, in plain English, that's what I would say. It's, 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 you are just accessing your data by virtual insights and seeing the results of what you are looking for. Be it the people who have been educated at this school and got these qualifications, it's how that, that has been defined in, in simple terms. My appeal to all of you is that uh, those nice iPads that you have, the flash that is, that is there, it will contain, yeah, there is a flash in a black uh, sachet. That flash contains a proposal form that you can copy for your company or that you, if you're an insurance company or your broker, a proposal form that you can send to your clients to complete. There's no harm in knowing what the rate could be, uh, how much you would charge them for to get the type of insurance. I think just to get a quote. And then as we go into the month of October, I know it's a time for our strategic planning. We also include cyber insurance as part of our strategic planning for, for the coming year. If you are a client that you use their policies in October, I think this is also a perfect time that you just uh, just request for a quotation and see how cheap it is. I think when I when I was speaking to most of the insurance companies, they say that this rate is quite low. You know, but I think from where we are coming from, I think this is a, a product that uh, we are giving you more like a penetration price, and it can be a very difficult price to change in the future once you're on board. But when you come, when you jump into the ship a bit later, you may find that you're coming at a, at a much higher price. So I think the, quite a number of you have also been privileged to be part of the people that we think can join in in the first big bubble uh, uh, of, of, of the list of clients that we are provided to, uh, that we're going to provide with, the, with this discounted rating. Um, so please complete the proposal form. Also, in that, in that flash, is a full insurance wedding that if you have any questions, you can consult. And you can still consult us with FPC Reinsurance or via insurance company. We are willing to assist to ensure that you are, we, we all understand the product before you can actually come on board. Having said that, uh, all I'm left to do is to thank Cuthbert and Tim for organizing. Uh, this, this event, I think they did a splendid job. Can you please give them a round of applause? And by the way, that guy over there, I, I don't know if you can all see you, you've got to stand on a chair. <laughs> <laughs> I think Cuthbert did well with his team, um, and I think we all agree that this presentation were all with our wife. That is why we probably were all up until now without even closing off. I would also want to thank Dr. Rukanda. Dr. Rukanda is not based in Zimbabwe. He's based in South Africa. And he, he flew in just for this uh, uh, just, just for this presentation. So I think Doc, we know we can always count on you. And uh, I wasn't scared coming here, walking in here at 8 o'clock because I knew you were a man of your way and you'd be here. And uh, just also as an as issue of emphasis, those who can talk to Dr. Rukanda separately, he does, he can also do the penetration testing for you. If you want, if, if you want to support us, I think you will be there, he does for us, what you can also do things. Um, things that I probably will not be able to, to articulate from a, uh, from, 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 from an insurance uh, person, uh, because I don't have the IT background. We also want to to, to take uh, Ms. Mkuru, Mrs. Mkuruba for taking off time and busy schedule uh, to come and be with us uh, this the whole day. I know you, you know you could have easily decided that my slot is in the afternoon, I'll just come and do my presentation in the afternoon. 
but you've been sitting with us the whole day and uh, adding value, taking notes from what people have been asking even before your presentation and coming to address the exact um, issues that people wanted to know about. So thank you very much. And to Ryan, I think if you all noticed, Ryan walked in whilst we were already within the pre pre during the presentation. Ryan also arrived in from South Africa this morning uh, for the sole purpose of, um, of conducting uh, the, the, this uh, awareness session. So I want to thank all our speakers and uh, Cuthbert, I don't know if you want to into something that you can do to our speakers. Thank you, Alice. Um... Now you can see me. No longer exploded. We, as the PC, would like to take this opportunity just to offer a little uh, token of appreciation to our uh, guest speakers for taking their time out to be with us uh, this whole day. Who we'll ask Yon to help us with the presentation of the. Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Okana, who presented uh, on the cyber risk awareness in the world. At this doctor, you get a chance to get a hug from Fiona. She recently got a date, so we are very happy to meet her.